Hello, friends. Welcome to Coding Garden. Uh, welcome to a code Q and A. We're gonna be—I'm uh, gonna be doing my best to answer your code-related questions today. So welcome in. Uh, I'm using a new closed caption thing. So, uh, for those of you that typically use the closed captions, can you tell me is it working right now? Do you see an option for closed captions? <laughs> and uh, the she boss, thank you very much uh, for that gift. Much appreciated. Closed captions are on. Nice. So the, these closed captions are a different plugin. Um, Instead of being an overlay, it should actually be like embedded in the Twitch player, which I think is a bit better. Um, so cool. Cool, 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 cool. That was funny. It didn't know what I was saying there. <laughs> All right, let's get into it. Welcome in, everybody. Uh, so if you're just joining us, uh, you will... Um, uh, you can ask a question <laughs> using, using chat commands. So uh, if you have a question, exclamation mark ask. And uh, Arian, thank you very much for that resub. Much appreciated. Uh, but if you do exclamation mark ask with your question, it's going to show up on this website, vox.coding.garden. Um, and this is really the best way to answer your question so that I have I don't lose it. I don't lose it in the chat. Uh, we have slow mode on just so you have you everyone that sends a message um uh sends she sends thoughtful messages that's the thing you say. uh don't don't spam the chat so right now there's a 30 second a 30 second slow mode which means you should take 30 seconds to write the best possible message you can and don't spam the chat that's all that's the only reason <laughs> um and thank you for that stretch william cameron honestly i was just about to stretch anyways and i appreciate it <clears throat> And D, who was it? Uh, 1710, thank you for the hydrate. Cheers. This is the best possible message. I agree, William. <laughs> yeah, that's the other thing. So when I start answering questions, it'll be a few minutes before I start answering questions. But when I start, you can type exclamation mark here, and then that will bring it to the top. I try to only answer questions for people that are actually here. So you can see there are some questions that were asked like a month ago a week ago, a few weeks ago, but uh, I won't answer your question unless I know that you're here in the chat. So, yeah. Welcome to the digital highway. <laughs> and welcome in the real Enrico. Yeah, a lot of people had questions about the music today. Uh, this is all from Chill Hop. This is the album that I've been playing. Um, and the first six songs from the album played during the intro. So, yeah. What's my opinion on the $8 for Twitter blue tick? They got to make money somehow. I don't know. I don't really use Twitter, so I don't have much of an opinion on it. Yeah. Beautify 3 finally... Did it, though? I, like, their website isn't updated. Because um, I, I looked this morning. Maybe make sure, like, I'm not, I'm not loaded from the cache. Because uh, it still says... I mean, I guess is it in release candidate? Is that what we're dealing with here? Um... Check their Twitter. Well, they need to update their website because <laughs> it says target release soon and we're in alpha and the beta is live. Murdoch is still banned on Twitter? Well, that's unfortunate. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for this, Jules. We'll look into this because uh, we, we use a lot of Vue.js here, so this is, this is interesting news. Though I'm always hesitant to open Twitter on stream because, well, this didn't happen on stream, but the other day... I lo like I went to the homepage and it popped up a message and it was like, is this you still your phone number? And it put the phone number like all right there. And I was like, what if I had opened that on stream? Um, so I, I'm very careful to open Twitter links on stream right now. Um, okay. Uh, Vutify, cheers to Vutify 3. So they live streamed it on Halloween. That's pretty cool. Um... Streaming on Twitch and answering questions. That's cool. I didn't know. I didn't know John Leader had a Twitch. Shouts out to John Leader. Um, let's see. He's only got one past broadcast. He is an affiliate though. Drop a follow. Drop a follow. Shouts out to this dude. Um, I met him once. I met him once at View uh, at ViewConf. <laughs> um, definitely go drop a follow over there. I, I, it'll be fun to watch him uh, stream View stuff. Um. Okay, all, all, all of that to say, yes, it is released? I don't know. They they still need to update their website. 
but that's that's cool glad to know we'll have to use it at some point like i'll i will i will use it on stream i'll even do like a youtube video on it when beautify js says it's version three because right now this is potentially confusing it might be that they force you to go to next.beautifyjs.com because uh there are so many people that'll that are still on version two um so yeah First of all, the fact that they have dark mode in the docs is awesome because <laughs> Beautify uh, Two, I don't think, had that. So that's great. But yeah, we'll have to we'll have to look at it some at some point. All right, uh, welcome in everybody. Glad to have you. Uh, it's Wednesday. <laughs> it's Wednesday. Let's say hi to everybody, and then uh, I'll start answering some questions. Um, and I will say, I'll say this right now. So if you're just showing up in the stream and you really, really want your question answered, I'm gonna do my best to answer any question that would typically take less than five minutes to answer. And I'm going to try to get all of those out of the way first. And then if we have some more involved questions, I'll get into that afterwards. But I, I know like the reason there are so many questions on here is because sometimes I take a long time to answer them. Today, I'm going to do my best. I'm going to set timers, and I'm going to make sure that I don't ramble on for a long time so that I can answer as many questions as possible. With that said, I have one minute and 30 seconds to say hello to everyone. So if you want to say hi to me, just say hi. Just say hi in the chat. Here we go. Uh, Drills, what's up? Welcome in. What's up, Coder Mutahai? And uh, Damon and BTRSL and Timon and Vinci and the SheBoss and PubPlip and Coding Garden Fan. Uh, and what's up, uh, Nuajaman and Limeodes and Murdoch and uh, Javeds, Javids. Uh, and uh, thank you for that resub. I'll read your I'll read your message in a second. Uh, what's up, Stony and C Nikolov and Sal uh, Salahuddin. And uh, if you do have a question, be be sure to use exclamation mark ask followed by your question. So. See Nikolov, if you haven't done that yet, re-ask your question with exclamation mark ask so I don't lose it. And what's up, Slahudin and Volturbike and Pablo and Ricky U and Ryan Rogan and David and Lakshman and unknown ABCD and Aaron uh, and username. Hello, what's up, Vive and Venoms and Origin and Prasanth and Andrew Lane and the Rufa and Ox Neo and It's Me Delano. And is this name available though? Hello, hello, welcome in. What's up, uh, Guji Propful and the Mixed D and Co Cute Pony and Ghost Exist and D1710 and par Parkour Peter. Uh, and Matik, and Tanner Barcelos, and Tomek, and Tavi, and Kuyir, and Just Quack, and William Cameron. Welcome in, everybody. Glad to have you. Uh, quite a few first timers too. Welcome in, first timers. Uh, you, you, you're welcome here. We we, we like beginners here. <clears throat> uh, that's. I mean, this is this is in general this is cool to see because it's been a long time coming for version three. So yeah. Wow. Okay, I, I see, I see. And they literally said it in the release. It's still Beautify at next and next.beautify.js for now. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's it for the hellos. Let's start answering some questions. So if you have a question, if you have already asked a question, type exclamation mark here, it will bubble up. Um, and if you want to ask a question, use exclamation mark ask. You can also upvote others' questions. So if you see a question on here that you really like, uh, do exclamation mark upvote. And also, right now, you can upvote your own question. And I just saw that uh, the captioner <laughs> said, instead of upvote, it says a boat. Upvote, upvote, a boat, upvote, okay, about. <laughs> um, and then you can also add comments. So if you have some commentary on one of these questions, uh, exc exclamation mark comment followed by that number will add that question, uh, add that comment. Okay, uh, first question from Andrew says, how am I? I'm doing pretty good. I got so much sleep last night. I went to bed at like 10.30, which is earlier than I've gone to bed in months. Um, actually, I, that's not true because the night before, I think I went to bed at like 10. But still, I've been getting a lot of sleep. Though, when I go to bed early, that means I wake up way earlier. So I was up at like 4.30 a.m. But I got some coding done. Um, I, so the the thing that I, that I was working on yesterday, the uh, OBS IRL scene switcher... Um, I added uh, chatbot commands to it, this thingy. So now inside of OBS, and I need to add, add some screenshots here, but uh, now if the stream gets low bitrate or it changes scenes, there's a chatbot that'll send a message in chat, which is awesome. So yeah, sleep is great. I agree with that. So I'm doing good. Thank you, Andrew, for asking. Um, you can't edit a question, but you can definitely comment on your own question. So if you need to make a correction, just add the comment and I'll see it. Yeah, so I, I went to sleep at 10.30, woke up at 4.30, and then... Um, 
was up for like two hours and then went back to sleep and then woke up at nine. But I totally forgot. I need to read Bite Mark's uh, resub. Uh, Tavi, thank you for the follow. Irene Nofbuer, thank you for all these follows. Thank you for the gifts. Appreciate you all. Uh, and Bite Mark, with the 24 month prime resub, says, Can't believe it's been 24 months already since I came across your channel. I wanted to know, I really enjoy what you're doing here. I don't chat here very much. I guess more of a lurker, but I try to put you on even if I can't pay full attention. I appreciate that, Bite Mark. <laughs> you are what keeps the coding garden going. Uh, I love the attitude you have, projects and problems you teach through, and the community you're building. Keep up the great work. Thank you, Bite Mark. Can we get hearts in chat for Bite Mark? 24, 24, so here's the thing. That's a 24 month prime resub. That means 24 months in a row they have clicked that prime button, which uh, is a great deal of support. It's almost, it's almost, it's almost hard. Uh, it is, it's harder to do that than just to be a regular sub. So thank you, Bite Mark. I appreciate you. Uh, and Gabe, thanks for that follow. And Fruple, thank you for that five month resub. Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah. What is exclamation mark here? It just if you've already asked a question, it makes it it makes it come up to the top. That's the only thing. Um, yeah. Let's see. I missed this. Mod should appear at first, then subs, then regular people. <laughs> I think VIPs appear before mods, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. Um, well, actually, so so here's the thing. It goes by subs first. So if you're a sub and a mod, you're going to show up at the top. But the subs are going to show up before just plain old mods. So mods with a sub are at the top, then subs, then mods, then VIPs. <laughs> Um, you, I think you can see the sorting algorithm on my GitHub repo, but that's that's the that's the sort. Yeah, seedlings for priority answer status. I'm not opposed to it. Put it under ideas. Is that on here? Somebody do exclamation mark idea with that, and all that, so I won't remember it. Um, <laughs> plain old mod. Yeah, you're just a plain old mod. <laughs> all right. Um, uh, and again, I'm going to try to answer all the ones that I can answer in less than five minutes. Um, and, and then we'll move on from there. So cool. Uh, so next question, uh, comes from Ryan. Where did I start my web dev career? What was your first job and how did you find it? Yeah. Um, and, and Murdoch, thank you very much for the gift to drills. There's a whole lot of mod love going on. Uh, uh, we have the, um, Pet the mods or pet pet the mods. I think we have pet the mods. Yeah, everybody pet the mods. Um, yeah. So uh, this is a frequently asked question, but I'll talk about it for a second. Actually, I'll just read through my frequently asked question. <laughs> but um, first of all, if you're new here and you didn't know, there is a frequently asked questions page. So definitely check that out. Um, but on there, I do describe my my background. So um, I have been a highly technical person since I was in middle school. I was building like really simple websites even back in middle school and I just like taught myself everything back then. Um, and then I got a computer science degree and then I got a job building desktop applications with C Sharp on Windows. And then I taught myself like at the time more modern JavaScript like Angular and stuff like that. Um, and then I also taught myself Node and then I got a job teaching web development and then I left that job teaching and I was uh, uh, worked at a consultancy doing full stack web development. So yeah, 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 yeah. And I found my first job uh, through the career fair. So it was actually an internship um, at the university that I went to. So I went to the career fair. Honestly, when I was in university, like I, I had no idea. And actually I didn't start this timer. Let's change, let's, I, have, I have three minutes left to answer this question. Um, uh, when I was in university, I had no idea what I was going to do with my life. I had no, even, even after being in university for, and like learning to program for like a year or two, I still had no idea what the real world was like and like where I would find a job or anything like that. But the university I went to had a career fair and I was lucky enough to find a company interview and I got an internship there. That was my first job. And it was being, it was as a systems administrator. Uh, and it was for a company that built uh, software for uh, homeless shelters and food banks. So um, basically homeless shelters and food banks in certain cities like to keep track of all the people that come through um, so they can like track their journey, try to like find them housing or get support for them. 
Um, and this software basically was like a registry for uh, unhoused people. I think unhoused, unhoused is the proper word. It's, we don't call them homeless anymore. Um, so for unhoused people, and um, uh, they wrote the software for that. But my first job wasn't actually writing software. It was just as a system administrator. So this site was built with like Java and Tomcat and like I think maybe even, maybe some PHP and it was like a Postgres database. Or actually, when I got started there, they were migrating from MySQL to Postgres. And so as a system administrator, it was my job to, first of all, make sure the, that the servers were up and running. And then if, uh, if a given client that was running our software needed the upgrade, I would help do that upgrade. So that was my first job. And actually it was, it was extremely boring. It was, it was like, it was, I barely, they barely, sorry, they barely had anything for me to do. And, uh, and I just surfed Reddit all the time. And then I found my own work to do. So this whole upgrading of website task that they gave me was extremely manual. It was like, copy this folder, edit this file, um, run this command, all of this stuff. And so I basically took this, this manual that was like this thick that told me how to update these websites and I turned it into a bash script where I could, I could literally, uh, and it was interactive. So the bash script would ask me, ask me like, uh, what's the new folder that you want to create? What are the, the various template settings? And it would use said to like replace all of those and stuff like that. Um, and so it made it that when we were upgrading a website, it literally would just take me a minute to run this script and then uh, it would auto update the website. But nobody asked me to do that. I was just really bored and I didn't want to do it manually anymore. So, but yeah, that was my first job. Thank you for asking. <laughs> and definitely check out the frequently asked questions. Yeah, and, and I guess beyond that, so that was my first internship after I was in university for like two years. Um, and then I got another internship at the first company that I worked at. And uh, that was about it. Yeah, that was about it. Thank you for asking. Um, cool, 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 cool. Yeah. Uh, and Limeotes has a question. What is my current uh, career uh, <laughs> photo? <laughs> what is my current uh, photo storage solution? Uh, I'm just still just using Google. Uh, so, but let's talk about it real quick. So, I've looked at. I think it's like. Is it like PhotoP or PhotoPia? No, that's a photo editor. Um, Self-hosted photo storage. Uh, yeah, no, I know it's, I know it's not privacy, which is why I said I'm still just using Google self-hosted whole self-hosted Google photos alternative. Oh, someone was like literally writing their own. Um, I guess next cloud could work. I think Pi Wigo is the is the one that I was looking into. This is the one I was going to try to use to try to get myself off of Google. Though Nextcloud is a potential option. I think the main thing you want like with with either of these is like an app on your phone that'll like auto upload photos. Like that's the experience that you get with Google Photos, right? But yeah, the main reason you wouldn't want to use Google Photos is because of privacy. Like Google <laughs> they're already reading all of your emails. They're already seeing all the websites you visit. Um, so yeah, let's actually let's let's take a break uh, cuz there's an ad. There's an ad. Um, I need to add the command. Um, um, I have acknowledged there is an ad. I will resume when it is over. We got about a minute and four seconds left of the <laughs> of the ad. Um, You saw an article about someone getting wrongly accused of illegal stuff because of Google scanning photos and documents. Yeah, I mean, I could see it, like especially uh, like law enforcement having not necessarily back doors, but like easier access into people's Google photos and stuff like that. But yeah, um, that is a thing. Yeah, and, and so welcome in all the, all the newbies. If you do have a question, be sure to use exclamation mark ask. Um, so that way I do not lose your question because I'm going, basically I'm going in the order that the questions were asked. So they show up here. Um, cool. And if you're still getting an ad, consider subbing with Amazon Prime because then, then you won't get ads. And also please join my mailing list because one day Twitch might ban me or YouTube might shut down my account. And if you join the mailing list, 
I can keep in touch with you. So please do that. All right, the ad is over now. Um, cool. So to continue answering the question uh, about this. So basically, I, I am I am doing. I started a few months ago doing my best to like move away from Google. I think my first step was to stop using the Gmail app. I started using uh, an, an Android app called Fair Email, which you can get on Fdroid. But what's really nice about Fair Email is like any time you click a link in an email, it first gives you a pop-up that says, this is the URL that it's going to, and then like, you, and it highlights the domain. Um, and also like by default, it doesn't load images. And then if you do load images, it's able to detect tracking images, so it won't load those. Um, fair email is really nice. I'm still technically using the Google email servers, of course. I haven't gotten away from that yet. But this is much, like I got so annoyed by seeing literal ads in my Gmail Gmail account. So that's that was my first step of switching. Eventually, I want a different photo storage solution as well. Like, so the only reason I have Google One, which is the um, the paid Google service, I guess because I get YouTube Premium. Um, but then the other reason is, um, and this is not my personal account. This is my Coding Garden account. But on my personal account, I have Google One, and I pay for it because I have so many photo storage. So this is definitely the next thing that I want to do. Short answer is I want to try Py PyWigo or yeah, PyWigo. I think that's right. It would be it's self-hosted. They have a mobile app that will like auto sync your photos. This is what I'm gonna try. I haven't tried it yet. It looks good on the surface. Uh, Nextcloud is kind of like an all-in-one solution. They also have like photo loading. I mean, all of my experience with Nextcloud, it was like a little bit slow, but that also could have been the ser the server that I was running it on. But this is another potential option. So. Honestly, Limeotes, I'm in the same boat. I don't have an answer yet, but these are the two that I'm going to try to basically replace Google Photos with. Uh, thank you for your question. And uh, thank hello, Alka. Welcome in. Will YouTube videos also come into that Google One plan? No, so you YouTube storage is unlimited. That Yeah, that doesn't count against your uh, overall storage. Your storage for Google One comes from Google Drive, Google Photos, and Gmail. All right, so if you asked a question, type exclamation mark here. It'll bubble up, and I'll do my best to answer it. Um, that doesn't, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, and, and this is really what you have to look into because, and it's not that it's just getting filtered by Google. They're like, there's a lot of email spam catching things that will auto filter stuff like that out. Peewego? <laughs> Yeah, one pixel tracking. So you may not know this, but in emails, typically uh, some email clients, if they want to enable tracking, they'll embed like a one pixel image. And then when someone loads that image, it, that's how they know that you opened their email. Yeah. Yeah. I was not about to sit through five ads in a row. <laughs> Sorry about that, David. Oh, yeah. And someone was mentioning was just using a NAS. Um, so NAS is Network Attached, attached Storage. Uh, and Zabath, thank you very much for the three months. Much appreciated. Um, but the, the issue with this is like you don't get the seamless user experience of, of like auto syncing your photos from your phone and stuff like that. You probably could set it up, but yeah. This hoodie is not a large. Oh, you, oh, oh, I see. You ordered view hoodie and it's not a large. That's unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah. And so the, if you're seeing some questions that are purple, that means the person has been here, typed the exclamation mark here within the past like five minutes. Or something uh, it's a certain amount of time if it's gray that just means that they haven't typed exclamation mark here so yeah <laughs> i paid too much for google apps and google workspace yeah yeah the, uh, the talk probably talked about like next cloud or own cloud the my marquee doesn't marquee there it is there it is <laughs> yeah Oh, that's unfortunate. I mean, what I've found is basically using Amazon SES, you don't go to the spam folder because they 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 really work on their IP reputation and they prevent spam and they do like validation of the users using their API and stuff like that. So my mailing list uses uses Amazon uh, Simple Email Service. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, wh whoever is sending the emails will, will potentially add a tracking pixel. You're right. Um, yeah. Yeah. So basically anytime I'm about to ask, answer a question, type exclamation mark here. If I'm already answering a question, there's no use in typing exclamation mark here because I'm still working on the previous question. <laughs> uh, so basically like wait until I'm about to choose the next question before you type exclamation mark here. 
People working at Google, Google still go through YouTube ads? I have no idea. There's probably some sort of incentive, like you get free YouTube premium or something. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's answer another one. So now's the time. If you asked a question, type exclamation mark here. It'll bubble up, uh, and then I'll do my best to answer it. <clears throat> Cool, let's answer this one from Coder Mutahai. Um, so, Coder Mutahai asks, this is kind of a personal question. My age is 19. I learned basic HTML, CSS, and some JavaScript. I now want to start learning, and I'm confused. Like, should I take CS50 first and then learn web development, or should I learn directly web development stuff? Which way will be a better for a strong foundation? Yeah, and then time in replies, hard one to answer, depends on what you need. My bachelor, de bachelor degree helped me a lot in understanding how things work from the bottom to the top. You can use it as a step zone, but also try a learn by coding. Yeah, I guess it really depends on um, what, what, what you want to do. <laughs> so um, if your plan is to try and get a job right now without, uh, uh, without going to university, then it probably makes sense to just like focus on the things that uh, the job will require you to do, which is typically, I mean, it depends on the job, of course, but it is, if it's going to be a web development job, it's probably not going to be algorithms and data structures. You still might need that for the interview process. But yeah, so if you're not getting a job, honestly, I would say uh, do what is most fun to you, honestly, and like what you're most interested in. And also like what your, what your focus is. Like if you want to build apps that a lot of people can use very easily, web technologies make sense. Um, if you want to learn more about like computer science fundamentals and the theory of computing and stuff like that, then it makes more sense to, uh, to look at um, uh, more computer science focused stuff. Uh, so yeah, somebody asked what's CS50. This is that free Harvard course. Um, this one, CS50, Introduction to Computer Science. You can literally watch every single lesson, and they have all the course materials online and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I, I, I don't have a solid answer for you, but but I think um, it really comes down to what you want to get done. Because at the end of the day, like you could spend days and hours learning all this computer science stuff and then not really get anything out of it, <laughs> like it, like never use it again, um, or or whatever else. Um, at the same time, like I will say, there are some potential unconscious competencies. There are like things that I know about and know how to do that I don't realize that I know it how and know how to do uh, because I studied computer science and because all of that stuff is like stored in my brain somewhere. So it's possible that that stuff helps me solve problems better. But when I directly think about it, for the most part, I don't really see myself using much of the stuff I even learned in computer science. So, yeah, honestly, Coder Mutahai, I, like, I would next focus on, like, if you know the basics here, then start focusing on some, some kind of front-end framework, like React or Vue or Svelte. Um, and again, if you're not trying to find a job with it, um, then pick the one that seems uh, like you're going to have the easiest time learning it and using it. So there's my answer. Uh, and, and again, like that answer depends on the person asking it and depends on what their goals is. Because if your goal was to find a job and you're, and you're 19 years old, so like, this is like it has to do with how old you are, like how much time do you have? Because see, like honestly, at the age of 19, you still have like a, you have your whole life ahead of you. <laughs> so, I mean, you're, you're not gonna really be wasting that much time if you do decide to like focus on computer science concepts. Um, because you got a whole lot of time. But I would say if you're older and like you're trying to switch careers, it may not be worth your time to learn all of that stuff because you can still get a job not learning all that stuff. So yeah. But yeah, CS50 is a is a free uh, Harvard course. Not free. You can access all of the resources for free. Um, and they have it, yeah, this is probably the better better website. But uh, you can see the, the, uh, the year but they have all of the past year's syllabus and, and a lot of the past year's recordings as well. It's a super interesting computer science class because, so like typically like computer science 101, at least for me, was learning how to program with Java. CS50 is like a whirlwind tour of all of computer science. So they do Python, they do C, talk about data structures, they do SQL, they do web development. Like it's, it's like everything all in a single course that really gives you an overview of like of computing. Um, which is very different from like a computer science 101, which is like intro to programming and computer science uh, 201, which might be like intermediate programming or something like that. So CS50 is pretty cool. 
But thank you for your question, Coder Mutahai. Hopefully that uh, that helped you out a little bit. Yeah. I wish I was 19 again and knew what I know now about CS. So, I mean, I think that's the other thing is like, maybe I like, I guess I'm biased because I just, I, I know that I spent so like, so, like a very, like a three or four years of my life learning about computer science and then barely using any of it in on the job. So yeah. Uh, be sure to use exclamation mark ask so that I, I don't lose your question. So exclamation mark ask, it'll show up over here. If you've already asked a question, type exclamation mark here. It'll bubble up and um, pranch all. Use exclamation mark asks or submit so I don't, I don't lose that. <laughs> yeah. Even if I was 19, I wouldn't get hired as a dev. I think it really depends. Like, I mean, technically, at, at least in the US, when you're 16 years old, you are technically working age. So it really depends on the company. Like, if they don't have a college degree requirement and you can show that you actually know how to code, you could likely get a job at 19. Um, Okay, uh, BTRSL, ask the question. Um, is there a chance I might try to build an electric circuit on a live stream? Um, I've, I've done it before. <laughs> so I'll show you what I've done in the past, but it would be fun to do again. Um, so I did an intro to Arduino a couple years ago. <laughs> Nobody hired you? Eh, you got, I mean... <laughs> um, You just have to find the right company, but I think you think you could still potentially get hired at that age. Yeah, this was January 26, 2020. Um, that was that was before we knew the pandemic was a pandemic. <laughs> uh, but in this video, um, I, I I give an intro to like C programming, uh, and I show you how to program like a simple LED on an Arduino, um, and then. Um, I think I also use, yeah, I also use NodeBots. So NodeBots allows you to communicate with an Arduino using JavaScript. It has to be plugged in over USB, but I did that. But we used to have this thing on stream where you could do a command, like uh, exclamation mark LED, followed by eight bits, and then it would light up the correct LED. So that was pretty fun. We did that. Um, and then at one point, we programmed uh, an LED matrix. Um, Murdoch says, back when I lurked, it never did anything. So, uh, oh yeah, so uh, we, we, so it used, I used to stream to YouTube and Twitch at the same time. And this was before I was an affiliate on Twitch. But so I streamed to both. So you can see in my, in my chat, anytime you saw a red message, that was a YouTube message. And I made tic-tac-toe and it was Twitch versus YouTube. Um, so it was uh, uh, basically the red dots for, or not tic-tac-toe, sorry, connect four. It was connect four. The red dots were anybody playing from YouTube and the blue blue dots, yeah, connect four, were the blue dots anybody playing from Twitch. So basically they could battle against each other. And then I used to have a camera and this would just be on the screen so people could play tic-tac-toe. Not tic-tac-toe, connect four. I don't know why I keep saying tic-tac-toe. <laughs> and Valk, thank you very much for that sub. Uh, here, I'll, I'll link this video too. Um... And then this one, uh, we basically did like a like a pixel art uh, matrix. So we used the, the same matrix, but we made it so that you could send a chat command to set the color of an individual pixel. And then um, we also made it so that you could send. A, but oh no, no, this was it. Yeah, so we made a React web page where you could basically do your pixel art, and then that would give you the command that you could run. And then if you run that command in chat, then it would it would light up the LED matrix. Um, so to answer your question, I've done some stuff in the past. It would be fun to do again. Actually, actually one of the things that I want to do, oh, this was your first stream, Limeotes? That's awesome. Uh, September 4th, 2020. Um, but what I want to do is I want to get an LED matrix that's bigger, uh, bigger than this. And I want to put it on my desk so that when I'm on this scene, uh, let me turn the blur off really quick. Uh, when I'm on this scene and it's like getting started, there can be like a giant, uh, uh, LED matrix right there that you all can control. That's that's what I want to do next for sure. Um, did I share that one in chat? I did. Yeah. So yeah, that'll be fun. I just need to find the right the right hardware for it because um, you can find all kinds of like LED matrices. Um, the one that I had uh, was like it was tiny and you like you really couldn't you couldn't make cool pixel art as much because it was smaller. So I want like a bigger one. Yeah. Cool. Thank you for your question. 
Um, Jules is saying, are idea and submit still relevant? Yeah, the thing about these is that they just stick around longer. And then if, if I ever need an idea for something that I'm going to be doing on stream, I can pull from this list. Um, so they're relevant. I don't do any specific streams around them, but yeah, they're relevant. Thank you for asking, Jules. Um, Pranjal says, intro to consistent hash hashing. I've never heard of it, so I'm, I'm going to pause on that, and we'll do some research to see what it is. And then uh, a 101 on the provider composer pattern in React. Let's see what we got here. Composing providers. Oh, I see. Basically, um, instead of having a big old nested thing to providers, uh, they've created a, a higher level component that lets you just pass in the providers as an array, and then it will auto wrap your children with that. Yeah. Um, I'll hold on to your question because so without without looking at their solution, we can look at this and try to derive how they how they actually implement it. So, yeah, I won't I won't answer your. I'll, I'll try to get to this in a second. Uh, do I plan to do any code kata stream? Not anytime soon. <laughs> like, for one, I want to spend a lot more time working on like my IR, the tools for IRL streaming. So I'm going to do more streams around that. And I do want to have at least one, one code Q&A per week because I know a lot of people and beginners have questions. So I don't have any code kata stream, uh, streams planned anytime soon. But for those of you that are newer to coding, uh, and what's up, Imhesh, Im Imhesham? If you're newer to coding, this is a great place to start. Uh, I used to do this stream every single Wednesday. There's like over over 60 episodes where I pick problems from this website called Code Wars, and uh, I solve them. I and, and I, I solve them in several different ways. And we also get a lot of input from the chat on like, is this a better solution than that solution? And it's also like a really good exploration of all the features of JavaScript and stuff like that. So that's definitely a, a cool playlist and to start and look at, but. I don't think I have any any uh, uh, plans on doing it anytime soon. Soon. Is it possible to put a question on Vox using seedlings? Uh, submit this as an idea, Lakshman. If you're still here, do exclamation mark idea? Because I'm not opposed to it. It could be that yeah, like if you have like I don't know ten thousand seedlings or something like that, you can redeem it for like an like an instant answer. I'm I'm not opposed to that. I, I like that idea. But if you do exclamation mark idea, we'll it'll put it over there. Best practices for storing user info in React. Uh, I'll skip that for now. That doesn't mean I'm not going to answer it. I'll just skip it for now. <laughs> uh, what's my favorite component framework for Vue.js? Let's talk about this because it's relevant um, with uh, it's relevant with the new Vue.defy. Okay, so quick history lesson. Vue.defy.js was the component library for Vue.js for the longest time. For the longest time, like if people were choosing a component library, this is what they chose. And it's really good, and it has a ton of components, and it's really awesome. Then Vue.js 3 came along, and there were some breaking changes. Um, I think they were for the good, for the better. Like I, I actually, I really do like the direction that Vue.js has has gone. But that, but with those breaking changes, that means that a lot of these libraries that were built on top of Vue needed to be uh, refactored or reworked to work with version three. So. Uh, Vue.js 3.0 has been out for let's let's get the right date because it's pro it's over a year it's been out for over a year now. Um, I don't know if we can get the yeah hey look at this uh, we have re release 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 dates. Um, well it doesn't say the version. Two years ish yeah oh here we go. So version three was yeah two years ago like it's almost like. It, two years. Two years ago, Vue.js version 3 was released. And it's taken two years for Vue.defy to like rework and refactor and get Vue.defy working with Vue.js 3, which is, a, which is a long time. I mean, uh, not, not to... It, it's, it's a hard problem to do, right? Because if you look at Vue.defy, it's a huge library. Like, there's so many components. And when you have a major release like this and there are breaking changes, the, the people that are going to have the most breaking changes are the libraries that depend on the internals of the framework. Um, so things like Vue.defy have taken a while so to, until they can fully support version 3. And 
the good news is uh, just two days ago, um, Vutify now finally supports Vue version 3. So if you go to next.vutify.js.com, these are components that you can use with Vue version 3. Um, and I, I don't know if I can suggest this yet because um, I think more people have to use it. Obviously, there was like bug testing and everything before they made it an official release. It's not beta. It's not alpha. It's released. Um, as, but that said, I don't know how different it is from the original. So I think it would take some work to, to know if like this is the way to go. So uh, with that little bit of history, Vuetify used to be the thing everything everyone chose. But since they didn't support Vue 3 yet, people were choosing other options. Let's talk about the other options. Uh, Quasar um, actually doesn't have dark docs. Watch your eyes. Watch your eyes. OK. Um, and this is actually an interesting platform because it lets you build mobile apps, desktop apps, and web apps. Um, and we'll, we'll give ourselves uh, three more minutes to talk about this. Um, but it supports Vue 3. And we I used this recently in, a, in an app that was building. So this actually does support Vue 3. So that's a potential option. Uh, the other option is uh, Prime Vue. This one. I'm sorry, everyone, for the, for the flashbang. Here, do they have dark mode? They have dark mode. We like any website that has dark mode, honestly. <laughs> But Prime View is another option. They support View 3, and they actually have a lot of different themes. Um, uh, well, let's actually look at uh, the buttons. And then I think there's an option to change the theme. I, I agree, Ryan. Without dark mode, it is unforgivable. Uh, click the cog. Oh, here we go. Yeah. So you can choose your theme. This so this Prime View honestly se like it seems really cool. Okay. They didn't tell me that they were going to turn off dark mode when I changed the theme. Well, <laughs> it's cool because they have a lot of built-in themes. The one thing to look out for is parts of this are a paid product. Now, not that that's bad. Like I think it's 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 it is it's good that as open source as an open source project they're figuring out ways to make money. But there are certain aspects of this that you can only use if you're a paid user and I think like the custom theming tool and stuff like that um that is what you potentially need to be a pro user for. On the surface it's free, but there you'll have to look into it. There are certain things that you can't do unless you pay for it. Um, so that is something to think about. At the same time, Prime View looks pretty sweet. The fact that they have all these built-in themes and they have a ton of really good components, I think it's a good a good contender for for uh, component library. The other thing to consider is um, what if you don't want um, what if you don't want material design? And Vutify is material design. So this is that like classic Android Google look. And let's say you don't want your website to look like that, Prime View might be a good option because they have other themes that are uh, not necessarily material design. Like you can actually choose a, a bootstrap theme that doesn't look like material design. So that's that's another thing to think about. Um, anyone in chat, can you tell me um, what are some other... We need to... We need to make our own countdown timer with dark mode, <laughs> I guess. Um, what are some other component libraries for Vue that you would recommend? This question comes from It's Me Delano. So yeah, personally, I really liked Vutify. They didn't support Vue 3, so I used Quasar. I also tried Prime Vue, which has seemed really nice. So the question is hard to answer because Vutify 3 just came out, and I'm going to need to try it again. Um, I guess the other option is if you look into Tailwind component libraries, you can probably find something for Vue. So um, Flowbyte is the thing we dabbled in. Uh, but this is a uh, component library built on top of Tailwind. Um, and they do have a plugin for Vue. So if you look at the, the Vue one, um, Flowbyte components, they actually have Flowbyte Vue, which is a standalone component library, which works very similar to all of these other ones. So Again, we always look at buttons as an example. But uh, once you install Flowbyte View, you can import that button component, and then you get a button that's themed like that. So Flowbyte is something to look into. There might be something for Daisy UI, which is another Tailwind one. But 
Thank you for your question. The answer is, I don't know because things are changing and I really need to try Beautify again to make sure that it's still good and still the best. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. It's me, Delano. Okay. Uh... You found customizing Beautify quite hard. If you want to go away from the material. Yeah, and again, that's the, that's the other thing to consider. It's like, if you're choosing Beautify or Quasar, you're basically choosing material design. Um, so you might consider something else if that's if that's the thing. Uh, Clarity, never heard of it. Let's check it out. Also, dark mode for the link me. <laughs> Actually, let, let me just do this really quick. I can I can um, I can add it with with stylus. So write a style for this. Um, no, not that. Write a style for linkme.versal.app. Here we go. Uh, and it's me, Delano. Thank you, thank you for that prime sub. You didn't have to do that, but I, I appreciate it. Uh, okay, let's take everything. Let's make the background uh, E. Uh, no, uh, three. And the color E. Nice. We got dark mode. <laughs> dark mode on uh on link me what was the other thing i was gonna say we needed dark mode for uh oh countdown timer uh okay shield your eyes really quick let me see if i if it's easy enough to just do the same styles on um timer tab eh it's not horrible. We can <laughs> we can we could spend a bit more time doing it. I guess I technically could have just turned Dark Reader on. Oh well. Um, first of all, let's look at Clarity. So this is a component framework that um, who was it? Uh, Valk mentioned. Global styles. CDS button. Cool. Oh, and then they so they have it for core, and then they have it for Angular. Do they have a view version? I guess technically you would use the web components if you wanted to use this for view. Cool. Awesome. Thank you for your question. Um, how many questions got answered? I think like three. <laughs> so, uh, should I think about these two commands when porting Vox to Discord? I think those should go into either uh, a standalone stream ideas channel, and then don't worry about submissions. I think the main the main use for submissions is. Um, Why does this have my name on it? Well, I didn't ask this. <laughs> this is not this is not me. Somebody hacked my account. Uh, it doesn't matter. Um, I, if, yeah, so I would say don't worry about it right now, drills. But but think about it like this. I put it. Oh, I put it there on. But oh, this is the user. This okay. That makes sense now. <laughs> yeah. Um, that makes sense. Uh, don't worry about ideas for now, but I think the idea there would, these should actually just get posted to Discord. So that way we don't lose them and then we can have actually discussion around them in Discord. But it should be a separate channel or a separate forum for them. Thank you. Thank you for, for that, Jules. Um, all right. If you've asked a question, type exclamation mark here. It'll bubble up and I'll do my best to answer it. What's up, the jive? Oh, I appreciate that. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I'll answer this one real quick because um, I made a video on it. So Vant Vanta Dev is asking, what are some good resources to learn JavaScript slash uh, web development? Um, if you take a look at my YouTube channel, uh, I have a, a playlist called Learning Starts Here. And if you check this playlist out, uh, the second video in the playlist talks about free online resources to learn to code. Um, I think we have a learn command. Yeah, so check that playlist out. Um, but my short short version of it is uh, free code camp is the first place to check out. And then uh, the Odin project is another place to check out. Um, 
those are the the two the two and the the two that you should definitely check out um but they do things very differently and uh, and i mentioned it in that video also they don't have um dark mode <laughs> um the Odin Project does not hold your hand. You're going to have to do all of the work and all of the research and everything else yourself. Free Code Camp is a bit more hand-holdy in that like, all the, a lot of the code you write is just inside the web browser, and they have like a step-by-step -step kind of tutorial. Free Odin, the, the Odin Project is more, here's an article, go read it, come back here and answer these questions. Uh, but I would say that like, the Odin Project is, it because it forces you to... Uh, do those kinds of things, you'll you, you'll get used to the idea of like learning things yourself early on. Whereas the free code camp will um, um, uh, hold your hand a bit more, so you won't be as used to like finding your own resources and your own answers. So those are the two main ones. There's definitely a lot more. And actually, I started a, a GitHub repo. It's not very organized, but it is another place to look because we put a bunch of um, resources in here. So learn to code resources. Yeah, a uh, full stack open. This is one I, I always forget. So uh, I think this is by uh, University in Helsinki. Yeah. Something like that. But this is a course by a university, but they, they make it completely for free. It has all of the online content. So definitely check out this uh, this document as well. There's a ton of links in this document. So like try not to get overwhelmed. I would say like pick one and just like use it. But um, <laughs> try, try not to get overwhelmed by all the links. Um, so yeah, thank you for your question, Vantadev. Cool. Try to answer this one really quick as well. Yeah, you're welcome, Vanta. Ho hope, uh, good luck, good luck, and <laughs> hope, hope you learn to code. Um, T. Kozer is asking, would, you, would I use NPM packages that aren't maintained? I'm trying to implement the SRP protocol, and the one package I found on NPM isn't active. Here's the package. So this is like the, the dilemma of... <laughs> Uh, trying to use packages from from npm so like you can see the last commit on here is 2018 um and but it implements the secure remote password protocol i actually haven't heard of that um interesting interesting but to more generally answer your question would i use npm packages that aren't maintained it depends. There are certain things in computing and certain things in web development that actually don't need to be updated constantly. Like there are certain libraries that they were implemented and that's kind of all you need. Like they, they still technically work. Of course, if like security vulnerabilities were, are found, you would want them to be patched. But there are certain types of libraries that like just don't have that attack surface because it's just like a, a function call. Like it doesn't access the network or anything like that. Uh, that that kind of thing. Um, so uh, that's that's what you need to consider. Like um, if you do an npm install of this thing and it actually shows you that there are a bunch of vulnerabilities, you might actually want to look into those to see if there are things that you care about and things that would could potentially be exploited if you're using that library. That's one thing to consider. Um, the other thing um, is also to look at like their uh, the number of um, npm installs. So like if we if we look at this on npm, let's see. Uh, secure remote password last published five years ago, and it has 126 weekly downloads. So there are and there's one dependent. So oh, it's it's that other library that they that they have. So there are 126 people using this per week. That's not zero. That means at least some people are using it. So that's the other thing to consider. Um, the other thing you might do is use this as an example. So like you, you might fork their repo and then try to, for, first, of all, first of all, like fix the vulnerable dependencies and then also potentially like upgrade the code if it's using more outdated stuff. Um, like, let's see, like client.js. Here's the thing, even five years ago, they were using const, which is honestly crazy to think about because there's there were a lot of libraries, there are a lot of libraries that weren't using more modern JavaScript features five years ago. 
Uh, so the fact that it even has const in there means that, okay, they were, they're at least trying to be somewhat modern. At the same time, they're not using the class keyword here. Um, like technically this could be refactored into class, but it doesn't need to be like, it still works. It's really just a matter of like, uh, are, is it vulnerable to certain things and, and all of that stuff? <laughs> Five years ago, they used const and free code camp still uses var. That's funny. Um, so yeah, that's my answer. It depends. If there are no known vulnerabilities, go for it. If there are some, you might consider forking it, fixing and patching, patching those dependencies um, and make, well, not fixing the dependencies, upgrading to more like non-vulnerable dependencies. And I think the other thing is like, it only has three dependencies, which also means you, you could probably find replacements for these if you want to fork it and, and make and update it. So yeah, that's my answer to you. Thank you for asking. <laughs> um, all right. Let's see what else. If you if you asked a question, type exclamation mark here and it will uh, it'll bubble up. Okay, let's go for, well, I did answer Coder Muntahai's question earlier, so let's try to answer someone else's. Um, let's look into this for America 2050. So America 2050 says, do I know of any comment systems for websites built with frameworks like Vue and Svelte, so on? Um, I don't, but it's, it's worth looking into because the one that comes to mind is Discuss but I don't think that provides like custom components that you can add into your app. It's literally just like a, an iframe embed. I do believe anyways. Um, but let's see. Um, the number one way to build an audience on your website. Um, GitHub based comment component library. Discuss a comment system powered by GitHub discussions. That's cool. Uh, this was last updated three days ago. There's also utterances. Let visitors leave comments and reactions on your website via GitHub, heavily inspired by utterances. So, I mean, this is newer. It's inspired by it. They both have plenty of stars. This was last updated in February, but... <laughs> this is funny. They updated to Parcel. Well, they're going to need to update to Vite now. Not necessarily, but I don't know. Uh, a lightweight comments widget built on GitHub issues. Open source, no tracking or ads. Cool. Check these out. I don't know if these provide like a view component or a React component. You might have to like write a wrapper for it, but these like look like good options. Um, and, and I guess to dive deeper into what they're asking here, like... You, if you ha if you're in control of your own backend and everything else, you technically could implement a comment system. Let me fix my microphone. You could implement like an API that stores those comments in a database and all of that stuff. But depending on the kind of website you have, you might also have to implement like a user system and a login system. If you were to use something like uh, Discuss or G Giscuss <laughs> and utterance or utterances, um, basically most people, a, a lot of people have a GitHub accounts. So that's all they need to be able to add comments to your website, like log in with GitHub. And then um, you don't have to have add login to your website. So that's why people might choose these instead. Um, so yeah. And that's the route you're about to take writing your own. And, it, and, and I think if, if you already have a login system and you already have a database and you already have an API, it might just make sense to put comments in your own database. But uh, it, it depends. It depends on, on the kind of site that you're building. Cool. Um, a dash of Mexican has a question. Let's try and answer it. Uh, Do I know of any online companies that help with troubleshooting random coding issues for beginners? Um, not for free, <laughs> but, but I do know of, uh, I don't know if Code Mentor is still a thing. Yeah, get live one-on-one -on -one coding help. Technically this costs money, but people uh, and like experts can can list their list themselves on here that say that I'm really good with React. 
I charge fifty dollars an hour, and you can you can pay me to get my help. So this is like one potential option. Does anyone in chat know of other things like Code Mentor? Um, yeah, sites like Code Mentor. Top ten Code Mentor alternatives. In Influitive. <laughs> Helps B2B marketers, first of all. Okay. Helps B2B marketers capture customer enthusiasm and use it to turbocharge marketing and sales efforts. Don't don't go to that website just based on their description. <laughs> just, just spam my Discord DMs. Uh yeah, that was gonna be uh, that was going to be my next, my next thing is really just search for discord communities. So, uh, depending on what you're doing, like if, if it is general HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, we have a discord server where, where people will help you out. Yeah. So you can join our discord server there. Um, there's also, I do believe free code camp has a discord server. There's also, um, r slash learn programming. So you can ask on Reddit. Um, and there's also r slash learn JavaScript. I will say that r slash learn JavaScript, at least in my experience, is a bit more forgiving. r slash learn programming is f filled with a bunch of uh, gatekeepers and mean people. So <laughs> just uh, proceed with caution and uh, and all of that. But yeah, at, at, and then um, at the same time, you can probably find uh, Discord communities where people are answering questions. Um, let's see if we can find Discord community search. Um, Stay away from Stack Overflow. I mean, uh, yeah, it, it varies. Like I think, like some people are really nice on Stack Overflow, but but it varies. Um, so let's search. Let's search for coding. Yeah, I teach it. R slash coding help. I've never used that subreddit. Um, is it big? Their custom CSS is like breaking a lot of stuff. <laughs> Um, let's see if it's active. Yeah. I mean, quite a few people are answering questions on here. So that's another potential option as well. Um, and then I, I would just, uh, or like learn programming Let's see if that's on here. Yeah. You can search discord servers there, community discord, community listed discord servers. These, these, are, these all of these servers are, are public, uh, and available for anyone to join. Um, if there's a private server, then you potentially might need an invite or you might need to find it. What's up, Al's Journey? I'm doing good. <laughs> That's a duplicate and stupid question. You should be ashamed of yourself. Those are the kind of replies that you'll get from some people if you don't do do a search. Uh, and I haven't, I didn't search that. What is learn build tech? Yeah. You got banned from Stack Overflow after four months. Uh, man. Learn, build, teach. Welcome to the learn, build, teach community. And they have a Discord. Cool. Yeah, yeah. So plenty of online options. Um, I think let me sh let me see really quick what we have in our um, um, in our we have a how to ask for help channel in our Discord. Um, and I do believe we have some resources on like good ways to ask questions as well. Let me see. Um, yeah, that's a resource, that's a resource, that's a resource, that's a resource. So, um, first of all, I'll show you this. So on our discord in the help section, we have this read first channel. Um, first of all, it tells you search the discord, make sure your question hasn't been answered. That applies to literally anywhere you're asking a question, whether it's on some other Discord or Stack Overflow or on Reddit. See if somebody's already asked that question before, because then you don't have to ask it at all. Um, then you can ask your question, and um, also you can work on how to ask your question. So, uh, one of the things uh, we always say is don't ask to ask. So, like, don't say, "Are there any React experts here?" or "Does anybody here know Java?" Um, because first of all, a lot of people might not consider themselves React experts, but they probably might still be able to help you with whatever problem that you're having. Um, so you, instead of saying, are there any React experts here? You say, I have a specific problem with React that involves this. Can someone help? Um, yeah, and so uh, Don't Ask to Ask is a website that, can, that gives an example of that. So you can, you can check that out. Um, and then the other thing is, 
uh, when you're asking the question, imagine you were the person trying to answer the question as well. So if somebody was trying to answer your question, what are all the pieces that they would need to know? They would like, like in order to answer your question. Um, and so that is talked a bit more about on the XY problem. Um, because like this, this is another thing why like a lot of people are like mean when they're trying to answer your question. It's like you ask a question, but then the person is like, well, that's not actually the question you want to ask. Or like you're asking this question and I can give you the answer to it. But at the end of the day, your real problem was here, not over here. So a lot of times when you're trying to find an answer as, as a beginner or as maybe someone that isn't as experienced in a specific area, you may have gone down some rabbit hole and you think you need to ask some question, but really you're asking the wrong question. <laughs> it's, it's kind of hard to describe, but basically uh, if you can think about your, your question that way, you can also start further back and make sure that you have your, your base foundation and your base understanding uh, good as well. What's up, Warwick? Uh, my dog is doing good. He's really sleepy today, but he's doing pretty good. Um, and then this website is how to ask questions the smart way. It's really long, but um, this also says like, before you ask, try to uh, answer by searching the archive, search the web, read the manual. Uh, this is a bit outdated, but like, you know, read the documentation, um, all of that good stuff. Uh, there's a lot of things you can do to make sure you ask good questions and make, and which in turn, make sure that you get good answers. Um, so if you join the discord, all of that's detailed here as well. So yeah. Um, oh yeah, and then there's a Stack Overflow specifically on how to ask a good question. Okay. Thank you for your question. Um, how do I get the Twitch avatar URL? Uh, the Twitch API. Yeah, you're gonna have to request by user ID. Um, but if you look at the Twitch API reference, yeah, read the free manual. That's what that stands for. Because <laughs> all the manuals are typically free. Um, uh, yeah, I, I wanted to come up with like a new acronym. So like read the manual, please. RTMP, which is really real-time media protocol, but read the manual, please, um, instead of RTFM. Uh, because RTFM already is like, it's a hostile answer, right? Because it's like, if you just read the manual, then you'll get the answer to your question, which isn't necessarily true. And then especially for, like, because a lot of times the manual or the, or the documentation isn't as good. So, you know, RTD, the, um, uh, uh, read, read, read the documentation. <laughs> yeah. So the question like, how do I format the credit card number to store in my database? And the answer is you don't store credit card numbers in your database. Uh, for the most part, you, you use a service to do that. PRTM, PRTD. Um, really, it's just like, but the thing is like, so when I was a teacher, I would use this a lot too, because a lot of people just don't read the instructions. Like they're given, um, <laughs> um, they are given, um, oh yeah, I, I was answering your question. Here it is, get users um, right there. And then if you want to see the code that I wrote to do it, um, it is in the API source folder, uh, lib, Twitch API. And then I create a, a client instance with the client ID and authorization header. And then I have a get users here. Um, but you can see in the Twitch documentation, in the response, you get uh, profile image URL, and that's what you're going to need. Yeah. <laughs> D-E-R-P. Documentation explains rather profoundly. Yeah. Okay. Um, cool, 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 cool. Uh, <laughs> let me try to answer some other ones. Uh, yeah, so you asked this one twice. Uh, I'll, I'll give it a go. Razorson. Who says, what is the best way to schedule a task to run, for example, once or twice a day on a server in Node.js? Um, so the concept that you're looking for are cron jobs, which is a, a Linux concept. Um, if your server is a Windows server, I still think that they have an idea of cron jobs. But th this is basically what you want to look into. 
Um, and it's not specific to Node.js. You basically could write a Node.js script and then schedule it as a cron job. So like you write a Node.js script that does the thing you want it to do, and then you can schedule it uh, as a cron. So Windows has scheduled task. You might, might use something similar there. Um, that said, there are some NPM packages that will help you with this that are like JavaScript native. So this cron package, which has 1.5 million weekly downloads, um, basically allows you to schedule cron jobs from within Node.js. But just know that this is typically running on a Windows system, or sorry, on a Linux system. And when you do this behind the scenes, it actually is just creating a cron job for you. Um, but if you are, if you need to programmatically schedule something and you're in Node.js, then like this package could help you with that. Um, Windows Task Scheduler is a pain though, but there are good alternatives. That's good to know. I, I really only have experience with doing things on, on Linux and Unix. Um, and then there's also node cron you can look at, and then node schedule, cron-like scheduler. Yeah. Um, I think, I think node schedule, I don't know if it uses cron. Let's see. Because this is the other thing to think about. So if you use cron, which is built into Linux, um, yeah, I, I, I honestly, I would recommend doing it the cron way and then use potentially using that cron package on NPM if you want to schedule those things from Node itself. Because if you use some other dependency, like like this one, um, I do believe that it's not scheduling a cron job. It is actually just going to fire off a function later on which means that this needs to be a long running process. So basically your Node.js script needs to be running 24 seven, and then you schedule a job. And then at that time, this library will kick in and run it as long as your process is still running. Um, but if the process ever crashes, then you potentially need to recover from that in some way. If you use cron jobs, the Linux operating system, yeah, it's basically like a set timeout or a, yeah, like it basically th this schedules it to run at a given time. Now, if it's it's not like daily occurring and you need to do it like every 30 minutes or something like that, this could work. But honestly, if you use cron, which is built into Linux, um, it's outside of the Node.js process. You don't need something running 24 seven. It, you can literally just point it at a script and, and then it will run it. But uh, node schedule is something you can look into. Um, and then, I mean, Heroku isn't free <laughs> anymore, um, but they used to have this thing called scheduled tasks and it's, it's very similar to, uh, uh, cron job It's basically cron jobs, but, um, with Heroku, you're not in control of the server. Uh, so they have like this little add on where you can say, oh, I want this script to run once every hour. But again, it's, it's not free anymore. So, <laughs> but if you're already using Heroku and you're already paying for it, um, you you could still potentially use the the job scheduler and then if you look at any other services they might have uh schedulers i i've never used cpanel for that but it's possible that if you have node.js on your system and you have C, cpanel then you could do it um adding a cron job yeah looks like you could do it and so a lot of times you'll see a cron job that points at a dot sh so that's a bash script but as long as you have node.js installed on that computer um, and inside of the node file, you do bin, uh, shebang slash bin slash node. I'll show you an example of that in a second. Uh, you can point it at a Node.js script instead of a bash script. Um, Node.js, well, I don't know what to search for. <laughs> like, uh, run Node.js scripts from the command line. Yeah, this, this is what I'm talking about. So this shebang, uh, a hash, hash bang. Um, if you put this at the top of your Node.js file or at the top of your JavaScript file, and you make it executable, you can now run it like any other script on, on the machine. So that's that's a that's basically how you would get Node.js to run as a, uh, a cron job script as well. Yeah. Serverless cron services usually are pay as you go with a generous feature. Yeah, and that's one thing I haven't looked into, like, um, because serverless spins up when you need it. I guess apparently AWS node scheduled thing is a thing is a thing zencron is a serverless cron so like the idea with a serverless cron is like it just spins up the server when that task needs to run whereas a typical cron job is on a server that's running 24 7 and then will run the script when it when it needs to be run and then there's firebase schedule functions again i've never used these but 
Um, yeah, you can check it out. And then um, M. Huggins says there's a way to do it on Versal as well. So those are things to look into. Yeah, what exactly are you trying to do? But at the end of the day, if you really need to, need to do something on an interval, like uh, send a reminder email to all of the users that have a scheduled appointment coming up. That It makes sense to use a cron job for something like that. Yeah. Yeah, I agree, the mixed D. Like, serverless is a weird name. <laughs> like, I think I think what's what's tricky about it is that, like it confuses non technical people because like you you tell the the CEO oh we're doing it serverless like oh yeah I want to do it serverless that's going to cost less money right because there's no servers but like that's I mean technically it might cost less money depending on how thing how things you do but I I don't know <laughs> um, okay. Cool. I'll try to answer this really quick from Chimp, and then we'll get into some like code questions, which are going to take a bit longer to answer. Um, so Chimp asked the question, given the choice, would you say it looks better on a resume to learn a framework for a language you know or learn a new major language? I would say it depends on what kind of company you're applying it to. Um, and also, I guess, like what you're trying to show. Because if you have on your resume like a new major language, like a language that hasn't been out for that long, but you've been trying it, you're kind of showing that you're on the bleeding edge and you're willing to learn new things. So it could be good to do that as well. If you're really just trying to have the skills to get the job, then this isn't going to help you for the most part. Like, uh, because depending on the company that you're applying to, they potentially want you to know the languages and frameworks that they're using. Now, that's not always the case because a lot of times companies will hire programmers, not specifically like a React developer, because they know that that programmer could learn React. Um, but at the same time, if you already know the tech stack for the company that you're applying to, then you're and you're a culture fit, you're potentially a better choice over someone who doesn't know that language or technology. So again, the answer depends. <laughs> but I think it probably lean on the side of like if the company wants on their job description wants you to know that language or framework, they'll probably care about that more than something new and bleeding edge. At least I think. And that's just my opinion. It's gonna it's gonna vary. So uh, okay. Let's answer some questions. Um, let's look at this. So I, I don't, I don't think I'll come up with a code example, Pranjal. So, um, but we will at least look into this for five minutes. So, cause I've, I actually have never heard of consistent hashing. Let's, let's look into, into it. Pranjal says intro to consistent hashing. First of all, what is consistent hashing? It has a Wikipedia article, so it must be real. Um, in computer science, consistent hashing is a special kind of hashing technique such that when a hash table is resized, only n divided by m keys need to be remapped on average. I'm, I'm worried about my... Uh, uh, <laughs> my Wikipedia theme. Oh, I could do filter invert on on uh, images. Let's do that. Never mind. I'm not going to worry about that. Okay. See you later, Ryan. Uh, thank, thank you for dropping in. Uh, need to be remapped on average where n is the number of keys and m is the number of slots. In contrast, in most traditional hash tables, a change in the number of array slots causes causes nearly all keys to be remapped because the mapping between keys and slots is defined by a modular operation. Um, procrastination start. No, I, I, I stopped myself from <laughs> trying to edit the styles. Okay. Uh, I've never heard of this and Honestly, I don't think I would really ever need to implement it. Uh, can you can you comment this on this Pranjal? Like, um, have you been asked about this like in an interview? Um, are you really just looking into more like computer science style algorithms? So uh, this is this is why you're trying to like learn about it. Let's see. Okay. 
Consistent hashing is used in distributed systems to keep the hash table independent of the number of servers available to minimize key relocation when changes of scale occurs. Okay, this kind of like just reading this sentence makes me think about sharding, <laughs> which is like how you scale a database. Um, okay, so you can spread the hash table across multiple nodes. Okay, what it is, why it's an essential tool in scalable distributed systems. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and just say that I don't know anything. I don't know anything about this. Um, I'd have to look into it more to like try to come up with like more a more like simple code example or something like that. And I will say that like scaling systems is probably where I have the least experience. Um, so, yeah. Thank you for your question. I don't know how to answer it. <laughs> What's up, Danny? I'm doing good. Thank you for asking. I was saying earlier, I got some good sleep. Um, I woke up early, wrote some code, went back to bed. Yeah. Yeah. It came across in a system design discussion. And that would make sense. From my my initial introduction to it just right now, um, It is. Uh, it would be used in a distributed system, which you would typically talk about in system design. So that makes sense. So yeah, I, I mean... I don't have a good short answer for you, but I would say if they asked it and then you think it's going to be asked again in another interview, you you, you might look into it and know more about it. Uh, M. Huggins says, I just got prompted to update to Ventura. How long should I wait? I don't know. Um, let's look into it. So I also got the same prompt and I didn't update. Um, how long has Ventura been out? That's the first question to ask. Um, It was announced June 6th and launched October 24th. Don't don't install it. No, 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 no. I mean, obviously it was in beta or alpha or whatever for, before it was officially released on the 24th, but um, you, can, you can believe that there are <laughs> unpatched security vulnerabilities. There are bugs. Um, honestly, I would wait a year. <laughs> I, like, I like to wait a year before uh, before upgrading. Uh, especially if the current OS that you're on is still getting updates. Like I'm on, um, what is it, Mavericks? No, Monterey. I'm on Monterey. And Monterey um, was released October 25th, 2021. So I I, I I upgraded less than a year after it was out, but I only upgraded to Monterey like two or three months ago. Um, uh, and... Because so typically uh, Apple supports their operating systems for up to three years. So because it was released on October 2021, they're going to keep updating it and and keep adding security patches until probably 2024. So right now this MacBook, which is running Monterey, is probably still good for the next two years. Um, but yeah, um, and yeah, you you can go back to previous versions. So like you technically, as long as the MacBook supports it, you can wipe the hard drive and, and reload any one of these operating systems if you can find the installer, which you typically can find. Um, but it typically involves a wipe and reload. So you would back up all of your data and then and then upgrade. But yeah, I say don't upgrade yet. Give it a few months. And uh, Lua Data, what's up? I know zero knowledge about coding. After watching the careers, I like software engineering. Is CS50 a good place to start? Uh, we talked about this a little bit ago, but you're new here, so I'll help you out. Um, it depends. It depends on what you want to do, uh, Lua Data. So uh, if you want to find a job, which is what most, and you want to make m make money doing it, which is what most people want to do, I argue that web development, so like HTML, CSS, and JavaScript is probably the best way to start. Um, whereas if you uh, go to, uh, if you do the CS50 course, it actually is doing a lot of like more computer science-y type things that aren't necessarily as applicable in the job, depending on the job that you get. Now, again, there's so many, like, it depends. It depends, it depends, it depends. But uh, if you check out my YouTube channel, I have this video, what programming language should you learn first? In it, I argue why web development should be the first. And then uh, if, I also talk about other languages and why you, and when you would choose those as well. Uh, and then this video has a bunch of online resources for learning web development. So definitely check out that playlist. Um, so yeah, yeah. Because it, it depends, like, 
CS50 is good is a good place to start for some people, but like I would argue that if you're just going to be getting into web development, CS50 not, might not be the place to start. So yeah, Muscle says great advice. I did a web dev course online free and got a job. Two years later, decided to learn computer science fundamentals, doing the thing that pays the bills, and then learning how it all works. Yeah, I mean, and that's honestly how a lot of people are doing it these days, especially like with coding boot camps. Like you learn trade skills you learn what you learn what people are using today on the job and then you maybe spend a month or two like learning some of the computer science data structures and algorithm stuff so that you can uh pass the interview at certain companies because some certain some companies even though you might be doing web development you still might actually uh get interviewed on computer science concepts but it varies by what company you apply to um yeah. And I mean, I would say like CS50 is is definitely like university stuff, but the the instructor is like one of the best teachers and he's, he's extremely um, David Milan. Um, he's extremely engaging and he, he does a really good job. Um, if you look on YouTube, like CS50 um, has I think they have a YouTube channel or they have they have all of their lectures posted. So if you go there and you look at playlists. Yeah, you can see, um, oh, they have an edu, I could learn how to be an educator. They have an educator workshop. Um, let's find it. CS50 lectures 2021. Yeah, so this is every single lecture from when, they, when he was teaching this course in 2021. Um, and you can see his, you can see his teaching style. Um, also, they've got like multiple cameras and he's got props and multiple screens. like. If I could take a college course, I would want to take it from this guy. But at the same time, it is it is a university course, so like, you know, you know, it's a thing. So, <laughs> uh, did that in twenty fifteen. Not something you're gonna do web design, yeah. You might even suggest small bash scripts or bat files. Oh sure, because I get I, I I think again it depends on what you're trying to do as your first programming thing. Because uh, if you want to get a job. Again, I argue web development. If you just want to automate something, maybe Python, maybe bash scripting. Um, yeah, let's take a quick stretch. There's CS50 web. Is it specifically targeted around web development? Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's, so that's the thing. And, and I talk about it in that video, uh, what programming language should you learn first? Like uh, web development is typically split up into front end and back end. For front end, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript is the only way to go. It's the only thing you can really do for, for front end. Like you, you need to know some JavaScript to be able to do front end web development. Um, for the back end, you could choose a lot of different things. I argue that uh, Node.js and JavaScript makes sense because then you only have to learn one programming language uh, Java is a separate programming language from JavaScript. They're two totally different com things. Um, technically, you can build backends with Java, but again, that's so different. Now you have to learn all of all of the the thing, the, all of the everything that it, it entails to learn about Java, like learning about the ecosystem and the JVM. And you probably will have to learn the Spring framework, and you'll have to learn the Java syntax and learn about object-oriented programming all of the things that you potentially wouldn't have to learn if you just built your backend with with JavaScript. So uh, it varies, it varies, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Haval, welcome in. Glad to have you, welcome in. I wish I had that energy while wearing a mask. I think if you go back to like the 2019 playlist, you can see him teaching without a mask. And then uh, I, I saw, I don't know, I, don't, I didn't see it, um, this is so interesting. So CS50 is web programming with Python and JavaScript. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I'm not saying OOP is bad. I am saying that you can build backends with JavaScript without learning OOP. You can't build backends with Java without learning OOP. You have to learn OOP in order to do it. That's all I'm saying. And not to say that OOP is bad or you should or shouldn't use it. Other than Node.js, what would you use for backend dev? Probably C Sharp. I really like the C Sharp uh, .NET ecosystem, um, and all of the C Sharp .NET stuff has been open sourced in the past few years. So um, there's a lot more community projects and open source projects and support there. And and honestly, uh, Entity Framework. 
So like when you're building backends, the thing you're typically doing the most is you're interacting with databases. An entity framework is one of the best ways to interact with databases. I don't know what exists in the Java ecosystem, but Entity Framework is the best thing I've ever... Entity Framework is better than than Prisma. Like, a lot of the things that Prisma does was, in, was even inspired by Entity Framework. Um, there's also, like, Active Record, which is the uh, uh, Ruby thing. Um, a lot of things were inspired by Active Record, but Entity Framework is top notch when you're dealing with database interaction and, and that's typically why i would choose the uh choose dot net because you can use entity framework with it prisma is an orm for typescript and node.js um it's fine i mean the the one thing that i don't like about it is that it's a code generation tool so you define your models and then it generates the, the client code for you which i'm not the biggest fan of because it means every time your models change it has to regenerate that code um it's fine it's fine. It has really good TypeScript support. So you get really good like uh, uh, type inference and type definitions across your code base. Yeah. I don't agree with this video, but I liked it. What was it? Object-oriented programming is bad. Uh, who did it? Ryan Will. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of like uh, a lot of videos like this where like the title just itself is triggering for a lot of people, and I think that's what like look at this. 1.8 million views on a programming video about object-oriented programming. <laughs> like, I'm sure they make some really good points, but at the end of the day, like, you're not going to stop these multi-million dollar corporations that are in business and are using object-oriented programming. Like, they're not just going to change overnight. You, you're not going to get rid of it. And what's up, Rat? So I don't have any courses on Udemy, but I want to. That's all of the time not streaming. I am procrastinating working on my course for Udemy. So one day. One day in the near future, I'll have a Udemy course. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no worries, uh, Lua Dada. I appreciate you. Thanks for coming in. Yeah. Yeah, so Prisma is basically... So w what I have the most experience in the in the JavaScript ORM world is Objection. Um, it does have TypeScript support, but I would argue that the, the type completion in... Prisma is way better than what you get over here in Objection, but I, I typically used Objection with Node.js before I was like diving into TypeScript. But Objection is one of my favorites. There's also um, uh, SQLize, um, which is also nice, but I found to be a bit rigid for certain scenarios, especially with like uh, nested relational queries. That's typically where all of these ORMs break down. When you have like a deeply nested relationship and you need to do like joins across tables, ORMs, a lot of these ORMs are not good at that. They're really good at like basic selects, but once you start doing more complex queries, they break down. However, objection is really good at it. Um, so yeah. 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 I believe if you start using OP techniques, Whenever approaching a problem, you always want to solve it using OOP. Yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree with that. Because, like, you start to think about the problem in terms of objects and object interactions. Uh, and Donald Packies, thank you for the gift. That was out of nowhere. Appreciate you. Uh, and thank you for all these follows, too. But, yeah, hearts in chat for uh, Donald Packies. I appreciate that. Hopefully you're doing okay, Donald. But, yeah, once you start to learn about OP, you start to solve problems that way. Similarly, once you start to learn about functional programming, you start to think about and solve problems that way too. Um, yeah. So my first Udemy course is actually going to be an introduction to modern web development and React. Yeah. Is AI a real threat to web devs? Uh, not, not anytime soon, but eventually I think it will be. <laughs> I don't know. Why not put courses on Pluralsight? Uh, I, just, I just know that Udemy has like a really big user base. So like the main reason I'm going to start with Udemy is uh, so many people go here and search for, I want to learn web development. And then they buy uh, a course. Did I spell that right? <laughs> they, so Colt, the Colt Steel course is probably the one most popular one. And, and then Angela Yu. But Coding Garden needs to show up at the top of the results here when you search for web development. And then I'm just going to build my own course platform, so I can keep more more of the more of the money, and I can pro provide um, uh, price parity. So like, if you're in a certain part of the world, you can pay met less money for the course than if you're like in the U.S., for instance. 
Any advice for updating extremely outdated dependencies? That's my current project at work and it breaks everything. Yeah, one step at a time. So <laughs> um, upgrade one dependency, run all of your tests and make sure they still pass. And if you don't have tests, now is the time to write tests. So uh, all of the pieces of code that are interacting with and using that dependency and zero turner. What's up, dude? Thank you for that, for that resub. But all of the pieces of your code base that are using that one dependency, you write tests for them. You make the upgrade, you make sure the tests still pass, and then you move on to the next dependency. It's just a one step at a time. And really, the only way you can do it confidently is if you have tests that you can run. Any advice on job burnout? Been working for more than five years and I'm having a hard time getting myself together to do any work. You need a, you need a break. That's that's it. Basically, <laughs> you need a vacation. You need to stop thinking about work. Um, I am just now recovering from burnout and it took me months and <laughs> perp drink and that purple drink thank you very much for that was it 10 gifted dang thank you appreciate you i don't know if i've seen your name in the chat before thank you thank you for the support uh can you ask a different question where do i think coding will go as we get more and more ai support for doing it um use exclamation mark ask i realize i'm just reading the chat now <laughs> we have we have a way of doing this so um if you have a question, do exclamation mark ask, and then I won't lose it. It'll show up on, on this website. What's the difference between Prisma and Kinex? All right, I'll answer this just because I was talking about it. So it's the difference between an ORM and a query builder. So if you look at Kinex.js, um, basically, you write Kinex code, and then that Kinex code gets directly converted into SQL code. So for example, um, Let's find an example anyways. They up, I, 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 I complained about this last time. They updated their docs, and it was just so hard to find examples. <laughs> um, I, I honestly, I don't really don't like it when libraries do that. Like, they think they're doing better. They think they're updating their docs, and then they just make it so hard to find examples. Because it used to be, like, the select query was, like, front and center in the documentation. Now it's deeply nested, but... If you look at this piece of JavaScript code, if you know JavaScript, you could potentially understand what this is doing. Invoking a function called column, passing all of the column names into it, invoking a, a function called select, and then chaining uh, from the from function. So this gets directly converted into a SQL query. Select title, author, year, from books. But you write your code like this, and then when you execute it, it generates the SQL code. Um, which is pretty nice if you're if you're used to JavaScript and you're used to like this chaining idea, uh, you you can you can craft some pretty elegant queries purely with JavaScript that eventually get turned into SQL. And then if you need to run direct SQL code, you could do this as well. But that's all Connects is is a high level query builder. Prisma is an object relational mapper, which uh, is higher level than that. So instead of writing those like chained functions that get turned into SQL, you write you you make uh, <laughs> You have objects that have functions and relationships via properties, and you call methods on those objects that in turn will get turned into SQL, but it's it's a higher level interaction. It's a OOP interaction. So yeah. And see you later, M. Huggins. Thank you for hanging out. Yeah. <laughs> What was it? What did Zeman ask? Uh, what is modern development? <laughs> sure. Yeah. So what I, what I what I mean by modern development actually has to do with all of the, like the front end build tooling, and really it comes down to developer experience. Like, why do modern web developers building React apps? Why do they have over ten dependencies? Why why do they? Um, uh, have this idea of like hot reloading and, and auto refreshing. Um, why is there a, a dependency for how they work with styles and a dependency for how they inter interact with API requests? Like all of those things, I would call modern web development. Not just not just like single page applications. Not just the idea of talking to APIs. The the whole the whole process because. If you start to look into it, people are writing React or Vue or Svelte or whatever else, they're all using some kind of like local build process and a bunch of build and local local build tools and local developer tools. Whereas if you, if you contrast that with 10, 15 years ago when people were doing web development, for the most part, all of the code you wrote was the code that your, your end users were running 
Whereas these days, there's all kinds of meta languages and, and meta frameworks that give you a really good developer experience. But at the end of the day, the code that your end user ru are running is way different than the code the developers actually wrote. So that's, that's what I mean by modern web development. And that's why I want to write a course on it to describe all of that <laughs> and why it exists. Yeah, so why a Hello World Next.js app is 280 megabytes <laughs> without doing anything. Yeah, I mean, technically, the built version of the app is like a few megabytes, but the the, the version running as a development tool, it, uh, running locally in development is, is really big. Okay. Um, let's see. Yeah, and, and honestly, like... <sighs> Uh, DX, I think, is the is the best description for it, but that term is now being commandeered, just like how the term DevOps got commandeered, and it like it doesn't, for a lot of people, doesn't mean what it used to mean. Because um, I was reading a like a super in depth article on how developer experience more correlates to like um, uh, developer relations and. Um, like how you market your SDKs and, and stuff like that. But that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is what is my experience as a web developer building a website? Like what code do I have to write to get a user input and validate that input and then send the result to an API? What is my experience as a developer writing that? Um, so yeah. Um, I feel like we've been answering so many questions today. This this timer thing is this timer thing is good. <laughs> this is this is getting me to answer a lot of questions. Uh, let's keep going. So, Oscar says, "Can you teach me Svelte?" I have a YouTube video on it. I know you did Kappa, but if you search if you search YouTube for coding garden Svelte, you'll see a few videos I did on it. Um, I did this Svelte extravaganza. Technically, this was before the latest version of Svelte. Um, everything I talk about is still relevant. And I built a soundboard with Svelte. And I gave an intro to Svelte. And I told tell my thoughts on Svelte uh, three years ago. <laughs> um, and I built a GIF search app with Svelte. So my answer is uh, go watch my YouTube videos. Um, but we will eventually uh, do more Svelte on the stream here. Uh, cool. Did you archive that? Well, it's gone. Okay, if you asked a question, type exclamation mark here. It'll bubble up. Um, best practices for storing user info in React. I don't have a good answer for this because it really depends. It, 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 there's so many depends. <laughs> it depends uh, on um, uh, what state management library you're using, if you're even using one, or if you're using the context API. It, it depends on if you're using uh, a, a library or an API for um, uh, user authentication, or if you're just using your own built API for doing it. Um, there's a lot of depends here. I would say in general, in general, uh, typically after the user is logged in and they have a, a token or a cookie of some kind, um, you would make a request to a backend that will give you that user profile and you could put it in React state. And typically there are multiple places in your app that need access to it. Like the nav bar uh, shows that you're logged in and like shows the user icon. And um, if you're on a specific page and you're a user of a specific type, you can see things that potentially other users can't see. So that specific part of the page would need access to that user info. So uh, in, in, in that instance, it would make sense to lift the state up so that the user object exists um, like in the store or at the top level so that any component that needs it could get access to it. Also for like routing, uh, client-side routing and redirecting, that would make sense there as well. But I need more info. Like, what? Yeah, that is, this is a very general question. I'm, I'm happy to give more info, but if you give me more specifics about um, what are you using for auth, what are you using for state management, I can be more specific. Do I play or have I played Minecraft? I've played it before. I don't play it that often. No. I know a, a while back somebody wanted to set up a coding garden Minecraft server, but um, uh, I just don't play. I don't play a lot of games. <laughs> uh, Shootint is asking, have I ever tried uh, Django? Django, is it good for backend? Um, I personally have only done very basic things with Django, and a lot of people would argue that it is good for backend. Um, 
I don't have a lot of experience with it, but uh, if you if you know Python and you're trying to build a backend with Python, Django is one of your options. Your other option is uh, Flask, which is a bit more. Um, I spelled that wrong. You should still find it, but. Flask is a bit, a bit more bare bones than Django. Django has a lot more built in, and then Flask is just all about like really building really simple APIs for the most part. But uh, to answer your question, it's probably good uh, because a lot of people use it. I don't have a lot of experience with it. What's up there? Hey, <laughs> I don't know what you mean. I, nothing? I'm doing good. Doing good. Um, do you know if there's an entity framework for MongoDB? Uh, no idea. I would I would search it the same way that you would. So let's let's see. But for C sharp and .NET, is that what you mean, Valk? Right. Oh, apparently you can access it with MongoDB or with Entity Framework six. This is an old answer. Whoa. And then the built-in MongoDB driver, um, well, not the built-in one, the, the uh, like this, the, the core one that you can get from MongoDB supports the link. And so link is another cool aspect of C Sharp. This is language integrated query. It basically gives you like uh, chainable function calls on innumerables, which is cool. Um, so entity framework. Six Mongo. Huh. Huh. So it has this MongoDB context. Apparently, that's a thing. System.data.cdata, system.data, C data, MongoDB entities. So yeah, Mongo uh, apparently Entity Framework 6 uh, supports uh, MongoDB. That's cool. Why don't we get the ID back when asking a question? Because my my app is <laughs> old. I literally wrote this in one night and haven't really changed it much since then. Uh, but <laughs> this, is, this is a good idea. It would be a good idea that when you ask a question, like the bot DMs you or a bot DMs you the question number or something like that. Yeah, right now you just have to go to the site and, you, and you'll see the number. Um, wait, did I answer that? Cool, and Shorts New Web, thank you for that tier one. Um, all right, if you've asked a question, type exclamation mark here, it'll bubble up. I'll do my best to answer it. Uh, this should be an easy one. So Yusuf says, do I like the idea of using pre-commit hooks? If I'm on a team, absolutely, absolutely. So uh, if you're not familiar, pre-commit hooks are essentially scripts that can run before a commit uh, happens and is locked in. So if you attempt to commit your code in a, in a code base that has pre-commit hooks, the pre-commit hooks could run the tests, run the linter, and if the tests fail or if the linting fails, it won't allow the commit to happen. So I think this is great, especially if you're on a team. This basically forces the developers on the team to all make sure the tests are passing and make sure the linting passes before making a commit. And there are ways to, like if you're if you're on a feature branch and you don't want to run these commit hooks because you know the pa tests aren't passing yet, you can pass a flag in so that they don't run. But the I guess the other th cool thing about pre-commit hooks is they work really well with uh, continuous integration because all of those same tests and linting and everything that runs before something is auto merged um, are the same things that would run locally on a developer's machine. So if it's running locally before they commit, you're preventing the server from having to run the the CI stuff, which costs money. So I think they're great. Uh, and the thing that I've used for it is um, Husky. Um, this it, it specifically if you're in, in a Node.js project. So um, I like systems to be so solid and rigid. <laughs> what could go wrong? I mean, you know, it, you, you use it uh, uh, prag pragmatically. Obviously, like if the commit hooks are slowing you down and aren't actually providing any value, turn them off. But I think for a team environment it makes sense because then like 
when someone pushes the code up and makes a PR, you're not spending your code review just saying, oh, well, you didn't run the linter, so please run the linter. This forces them to do that before pushing the code up. Um, so that's a thing. I don't know if anybody in chat, do you have other suggestions for like pre-commit hooks? Oh, and Drills mentioned, so for the question earlier about why doesn't the Vox DM you the question number, Drills and Timon are working on an integration to our Discord that will potentially do that, so. Okay, uh, Murdoch asks, how much would it cost for a few consulting one-on-one -on -one sessions a month to go over some of my projects off stream? I don't have a good answer for you, Murdoch. <laughs> the thing is like, I'd love to do stuff like this. I just don't know if I have the time because I'm like, I'm working on other things. Um, DM me and we'll talk about it offline. But eventually, like, this is something that I want to offer, and it's also, like, a potential, like, revenue source for me, is I could provide one-on-one uh, -on -one and mentoring sessions, even for people in the community, but I just don't really have the time right now. But DM me, Murdoch, on, on Discord. I'll, I'll talk to you. We're using Husky with Lint Stage as a pre-commit hook. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Um, <laughs> how to deal with incompetent team members. I don't know. I don't have a good answer. I guess it depends on like, what are they incompetent at? Is it like you tell them to do something and then they don't do it or they do it wrong? Or are they like confidently wrong where they're like way too loud and way, way too opinionated when at the end of the day, all of their opinions are like very wrong? Um, yeah. Oh, are, are you a core contributor to Discord JS? I, I did not know that, Drills. That's cool. That's cool that you're on my mod team. Um, not on this GitHub, uh, GitHub account. Nice, glad to hear it. Yeah, Discord JS is cool. It's how you in, build like bots for for Discord. Uh, and Valk is saying, at which perspective? As an equal? As a ma yeah, I guess that's the other thing. It's like, are they incompetent and they're your manager? Are they incompetent and they're have they have the same title as you? Are they incompetent and they're a junior developer? Like, I guess it depends there as well. Oh, yeah. And welcome in, Zagori. We do have a Discord where you can ask for help. I would say you should target your question, though. Like, what do you want help with? Uh, we have a, uh, a project sharing channel in our Discord where you can, like, submit your portfolio and, like, ask for feedback. But, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but I guess to answer your question, part-time married, it depends. Like, if they are an equal, don't F with my code. <laughs> That's the incompetency. Um, that really just comes down to, okay, so like they, they mess with your code or like they, they push a commit. So I guess it also come down to like, comes down to like team dynamics, right? And, and the way that you have the development environment set up. Because if it's possible for anyone on your team to make a commit and then push to master, the process is wrong. Like you, you, you need some sort of gatekeeping so that people can't just overwrite your code and push it to master. And that typically involves, um, like requiring code reviews, uh, locking branches. So depending on what you use, whether it's GitHub or, um, uh, GitLab or Bitbucket, they all have a way of saying the master branch is protected, meaning nobody can push to the master branch. It has to be, uh, merged and that, uh, pull request needs to have been reviewed by like one or two people. So you can set that, set that up as a process that will prevent people from like overwriting your code. Now, if you have that process in place and they submit a PR where they overwrite your code, well then now it potentially becomes a, um, a, a conversation because it's like, hey, I noticed that you overwrote the code right here. Why did you do that? Um, th this is, you've added extra code or you've potentially removed some of the safeties that my code had. So um, let's actually uh, scale this PR down a little bit and make sure that you're only modifying the things that need to change for this specific feature. Like that's a constructive conversation that you can have with that incompetent team member. Um, but but one thing I would look into is like uh, GitHub um, 
uh, like lock branches. So um, managing, yeah, branch protection is the thing. So you basically can say that um, no one can push to master and it has to be from a pull request and that'll prevent people from just like straight up overriding your code. Uh, but again, it depends on if you're using GitHub or, or GitLab or whatever else. They all have this this idea of branch protection. Um, so yeah, I guess that's my answer. I don't know. <laughs> you can <laughs> you can be constructive about it, but I think the process will help because if there's no process in place, then there's no guardrails to prevent them from being incompetent. So, how to deal with an IT lead who can't export a SQL database? Oh, you do it for them. I mean, at the end of the day, like get on their good side because um, if they got to be a manager or a lead without actually knowing anything about knowing anything technical, that means they're really good at networking, um, and they're they're good at being a, an employee. Which means if you get on their good side, then they will help you with uh, uh, promotions and and getting on the good side of the higher ups as well. Which also means that you potentially work at a company where non technical people are in charge of promoting technical people, which is not always a good sign. But at the end of the day, like I have worked at companies like this. So yeah, we work on a huge micro front end and few um, of the, I guess the, the pull requests are just atrocious. Yeah. But I think like, that's why pull requests exist because they're there to start a conversation. They're like, these are the changes I've made. What well, what's wrong with what I did and, and how can I make it better? So I guess let's, let's don't think about it as like a burden when you're there re revealing that pull request. Think about it. Okay. Like how can I help this person grow as a developer? Like how can I help them understand in a constructive way, why what they did was wrong and what they can do to improve it. Um, but yeah. And Alana, welcome in. <laughs> yeah. I guess that's the other thing is, uh, maybe not that like non-technical people are promoting, maybe the person that's in that it lead role is the brother of the CEO of the company or something like that. Um, not pull request. What is Pyrel? I, I don't even know what this is. Build highly modular applications, fully flexible for large scale portal solutions, breaking the front end monolith. Eh. Eh. I think the other aspect of it is like if if any developer can like can use anything they want, like Angular or Vue, and you like you haven't. Uh, set up like what the preferred thing should be, then you could run into to issues of like, there's too many variances, right? Like even you as someone reviewing the pull request, you may not be an expert in all of these. So then it's harder to review the pull requests um, if you don't know the thing that they use. So you could like force them to use a specific thing. I don't know. I don't have a lot of experience or any experience with micro front end. So, but thank you for your question. At the end of the day, I think that my answer is just try to be constructive as possible. <laughs> Uh, cool. I think I answered this. Uh, how does CJ's beard stay up? Do you mean my mustache? I trimmed my chin hair recently. In HDGB 404, welcome in. What do you mean, Diamond? <laughs> do, you mean, do you mean this? My mustache? I use mustache wax. Hmm. All right, uh, if you have asked a question, type exclamation mark here. It'll bubble up. I'll do my best. Cool, Yusuf says, do I think TDD is a good idea? Doesn't it slow down development? So TDD stands for Test Driven Development. Let's see if there's a Wikipedia article on it. Um, this one. Um, what's up? It's not GG. DG, welcome in. Um, so the idea with test-driven development is tests are driving the code that you write. So typically, uh, there's this cycle of red-green refactor. So you write a failing test. That's red. Um, you write the code to make that test pass. That's green. And then you refactor the code so that it is uh, more modular, can be extended more easily, and isn't as rigid as just the code that made that one test pass. Red, green, refactor. And then the cycle repeats. Um, but the idea there is you are writing a test before everything you do. And at the end of the day, if you, if you follow this process, you're actually going to end up with 
like 100% test coverage because you're writing a test for everything. Does it slow down development? Yeah, like by the nature of it, you are writing more code because you have to write code to test your code. At the end of the day, that's a trade-off though, right? Because if you, um, uh, um, what do I want to say there? If you, it's taking longer, it's slowing you down, but you have now have more securities around your code, right? You, you have more assurances that the code you're writing is going to not break in, in, in certain scenarios. And you can uh, refactor with confidence. You can extend the code with confidence because you have so many tests written. So I think there's a, there's a time and a place to do test-driven development. I fall in, in the camp of uh, pragmatic testing and <laughs> not even test driven development like if you if you've if you've seen me um if you've seen me write tests on stream before a lot of times i will make the tests pass bef first instead of like seeing them fail which is not good like there's a reason why you want red green then refactor like you want to know that the code you've written actually works but um I think like there, there are certain aspects that make sense to write tests for, especially like if they're, if that code is being touched a lot, or if you know that code is like very error prone, that makes sense. And that's usually where I, where I fall into is I write tests for what makes sense, not tests for everything. There would be people that would argue even that is not enough. Like you need tests for everything. And a lot of people that have uh, worked at a place where they're doing test driven development, because you do it so often, you basically... Not, not you do, but there are a lot of people that basically don't know how to write code without writing tests first. Like they basically, that's all they know because that's all they've ever done. Whereas if you watch me, a lot of times the like rapid prototyping and like small little apps that I build, those are not test driven. That's just like, I'm flying by the seat of my pants and I'm just like, I'm like coding for fun, honestly. But at the end of the day, it's not tested and uh, it's not going to be easy to refactor or uh, to, ex to extend upon, so. That's my thoughts on that. Yeah. I have not seen Advent of View. Is this like Advent of Code? Huh. 24 view coding challenges delivered one per day via email. Nice. That's pretty cool. Yeah. What about TDD in a startup? Would you choose this way? It depends. Pro probably not. Because the thing is, a lot of times at a startup, you're trying to move fast. And a lot of times, you just want to like launch your product and then eventually uh, when you grow big enough that you need to scale you would need to like rewrite everything anyways and at that point it might make more sense to like do things test driven but like, I, again i think it varies personally i don't think i would do it because typically as a startup you're trying to move fast and if you have to write tests for everything you can't really move as fast now again people that would argue that well now your code isn't tested. You don't have as many assurances and you're going to just have a broken product. But there are a lot of, a lot of the apps and tools and things that run the world were not written with test driven development. So I don't think you can make that argument that like what you're going to build just like, it's going to work for the most part. Uh, sure. There might be things that break, but then you could like write tests around that and fix those. I don't know. Personally, I wouldn't choose TDD. Yeah. And remember to delete your tests when you're done with them. <laughs> Yeah, so it definitely slows down development, but, you know. And, and I am more in the camp of, like, writing a more general, larger test after, like, writing a lot of the code. But, yeah. Are we, maybe, I don't know. I, <laughs> that's the other thing is, like, even thinking about writing tests, I hesitate. Like, especially for fresh spots, because, like, I don't I don't know how we're going to test Preact components in Dino or, like, server-rendered pieces. Like, I just, I just don't know, like, it, because it's newer. It's a newer ecosystem. Yeah. Um, how to delete your chat. So you can archive your question, but I'm going to answer it really quick because I think it's a good question. <laughs> um, are web apps going to replace locally installed apps? So this was one of the, the ideas and general ideas of uh, PWAs or progressive web apps. Um, the idea that you could build. Oh, yeah. And I, also, I missed some supports. It's Shalman. Thank you for the two months. Uh, part time married. Thank you for that sub. You're, you're too kind. Um, and short C web, thank you for the 28 months. I think I missed those. And thank you for all the follows, everybody. Um, well, no, I think Apple has adopted some of the pro progressive web app tech, uh, like things that are needed for it, which, um, 
is uh, w why these potentially have a f have a future. So yeah, Safari on iOS eleven point three supports a lot of these features. This is a very misleading diagram because it's not just do you support progressive web apps. There's a whole suite of technologies that are involved with progressive web apps, like basically being able to do native-like things in a web browser. So accessing the camera, accessing geolocation, um, accessing, accessing the um, like the notification API, um, being able to send push notifications when your web app isn't in the foreground. Um, what else? Um, uh, accessing the uh the the gyroscope and like the orientation of the device being able to vibrate the device like all of these things you actually can do in a web browser and I, to the point that like if you're going to build a pwa you might as well build a native app like i, I disagree like uh, the reason you would be building a pwa is you actually have a much larger reach because every device has a web browser not every device and, and every person is, is technically going to install your native application like through the App Store. Whereas if it's a web app, they literally just have to go to a URL. Um, and it's all web technologies, meaning you can have a single code base that targets multiple platforms without needing to distribute it in the App Store and without needing to use like React Native or Flutter to, to or, or even like Quasar to, to build the cross-platform thing. And then you have to distribute it in the App Stores and stuff like that. Well, yeah, I, I, it all comes down to like, obviously like ease of installation and stuff like that. Like you could argue that it's harder, but eventually it won't be as hard. And I think that's what we're getting at here is like eventually when all of this stuff is supported and people can install progressive web apps in that way, then I think, yeah, I don't think they're going to fully replace native apps. Like there are certain things that like should be native, but there's a lot of things that you could do. Um, I guess I just keep forgetting to set my timer. <laughs> there's a lot of things you could do that uh, you don't need a native app for, yeah. Yeah, but I, I think, like, I, I think here's the thing to think about, Ray Good. Like, if the end user doesn't have to install it, like, they go to the website and then the browser just supports it and then, like, there's a button in the bar that just says, like, install the app, I think your grandma could do it. It may not be the case today, but eventually we're going to get there. Um and honestly, it, it is the reason why I have focused so much on web development in my career and in my personal life. Like I, I used to be a native Windows desktop developer. Um, and then I learned about all the things you could do in the web browser. And uh, I was like, this, this is the future. Like APIs and single page applications, that's how everything is going to be. Um, that's the future. <laughs> like there's, there's like, it's, it's so much easier. And like, and honestly, like the programming, pro programming languages and the frameworks and everything else are so much easier than a lot of this native stuff and require less setup that like, you know, it's the future. Yeah. Yeah. So YouTube is a progressive web application and you don't even, you don't even know it. And what's up now, mistake geek. Welcome in. Yeah. So that really, that's my only argument is like, obviously today it is not that easy, but eventually it will be. So how many coding shirts do I have? I have three. I have this one, and then I have the red one, and then I have a white, one, a black one that just says code in white. Uh, which reminds me to tell you all about my merch. <laughs> you can, so, so this shirt was a one-time deal. You had to be following Coding Garden at the time to buy this shirt. You can't buy it anymore, but we do have this one, the code shirt, and then this one. We also have the dark JavaScript shirt and the now that's what I call code t-shirt. So technically I have this one too. So technically I have three code shirts. Yeah. Yeah. And so like, yeah, discord, Slack, VS code, all of those actually can be run inside of a web browser. Most people use the, like the desktop version. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I get what you're saying, Ray Good, and I think it's important to have like a dissent, like not necessarily a dissenting opinion, but a different opinion about it because I think you're completely right. Like, the the experience these days isn't the best, but I argue that we're not far away from it being a good experience because all of the pieces are in place. So, yeah. All right, if you've asked a question, type exclamation mark here. It'll bubble up. Uh, what are my thoughts on Create T3 app? It seems fine. I think like in general, the whole idea of the T3 stack is type safety from the front end to the back. 
And I think that is a good idea. That is nice to have. It's a good developer experience. It's a good team experience. So I think it makes sense. I personally don't really use Next that much and I don't really like React. So I would probably make my own stack that uses uh, TRPC, which is the, like the core of full stack type safety. And then also Prisma, which is like a really good uh, JavaScript ORM. So like combining these two, but then with some other uh, backend technology like uh, Nuxt or Svelte is probably what I would do. Yeah. But I know of a SaaS styled tool for React Native. I have no, I, I don't have a lot of experience with React Native, but I, but I don't know. Um, yeah. And there is Vue Native. So there's actually Native Script. And then there's Native Script for Vue. That's probably what you would want to use. If you find this thing called Vue Native, it actually is just a wrapper on top of React Native which is deprecated and no longer maintained. So don't use this. <laughs> but native script is maintained and then they have like a plugin for using Vue with native script. But native script is like the general thing whereas React Native is specific to React. Yeah. Yeah, see you later Jules. Thank you for hanging out. I didn't say that, Oscar. I didn't say that. So one of one of the uh, apps I, I have been working on in my spare time is TRPC, Prisma and SvelteKit. And I also tried out TRPC, Prisma, and Nuxt 3. But Nuxt 3 is still a release candidate. Um, but yeah. Oh, yeah. And then I, I don't use Tailwind at all. So that wouldn't be in my stack. Um, I, it, I was looking into, like, I think Tachyons existed uh, before Tailwind. And I actually do kind of like the idea. Honestly, like I think a lot of Tailwind was inspired by this, but if you look at what they provide, like here are the things that I do like about Tailwind. Being able to uh, set up a flex box without having uh, on an on an element without having to add a class, it's a beautiful thing because I do this all the time. Literally just create one CSS class uh, because I want something to be a flex box. Tach Tachyons has a CSS file you could add to the page that give you these flex you flex utilities. Uh, spacing utilities are really nice too, like these padding utilities. Um, and then I think that's about it. Everything else I would do with CSS. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> but that's, that's just my opinion. And what's up, Zelina? Welcome in. Honestly, and cause honestly, um, I, I need to make a more formalized video and, and argument about this, but I think the thing that people, uh, developers strive for the most, like with their styling solution, is like just knowing where the styles are coming from. And with Tailwind, you get that. Because you look at the component, you look at the element, it has all of the Tailwind properties on it. You know what that thing, at a glance, if you know the Tailwind properties, you know what that thing is going to look like based on just looking at the element. Whereas, if you're using CSS classes, now the code is in two spots, right? You have the CSS class there on the element, and then you have to go find where is that CSS defined, and that's not the best developer experience. But with CSS modules, you get really good editor support to where if a CSS class is being used from a CSS module, you can just press a key and instantly go to the definition of that CSS class, um, which is, I think, the developer experience that a lot of people want and why they're using something like Tailwind. So, yeah. Okay. Is there more content with a beanie or without? Probably without. I don't know. We could go through all of my videos to see. <laughs> uh, I learned HTML before the div tag was a thing. I don't think I'm really sure how it's best used, but I often think it gets overused. Thoughts? Yeah. yeah. So this gets into the idea of semantic HTML and um, uh why the div is over you. So div is a, is, a, is a division. So you can see in their example, divs spans, like if you look at this HTML, it has no semantic meaning, but there are elements that you can use. So there's like the heading tag, the section tag, the article tag, the footer tag, all of these semantic elements were added to HTML. So you can take code that looks like this and then it starts to look like this. So you have a header and you have a nav, and you have a main, you have a section. And so like, I would argue that this is this is nicer to look at. And even as a developer, it's like more, it's easier to see what's happening. At the end of the day, 
it's the same thing. Like the, all of these, um, I think like the default styling of all of these elements is the similar to like the block styling of a div. <laughs> there are other elements than div, yeah. <laughs> so um, it, it's it's a good question and a good conversation. Like I do agree, divs get overused, but um, with the with the 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 heavy use of like component libraries and stuff like that. I think people are just going to keep using divs anyways. And then if you're using certain CSS frameworks, that kind of, sometimes they force you to use divs. But um, I I like this. I like semantic HTML. I don't always do it myself, but I think it makes sense. And I do agree that people use divs too much. It's div soup. <laughs> Thank you for your like, your question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I, yeah, you're not alone in feeling that way. Namaste. Geek. I think that's why they, they introduced these. I don't know if it was like HTML four when they introduced all these, uh, semantic tags. And I guess the other thing is accessibility because these semantic tags also have, I think, yeah. So that is something to consider because these semantic tags have, um, uh, meaning in accessibility and like when screen readers come across them they can better handle them versus just a bunch of divs so <laughs> divs are supreme Zazaka. <laughs> yeah seo is for robots it's true it's true but but yeah but i think also like for screen readers too do i agree that writing semantic html is harder with react compared to view and svelte Oh, I don't, I don't have an opinion on that. It seems like it would be the same. I don't know. I don't know. Divception is a real issue. Yeah. 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 I know. I know there's a lot of developer tooling around Tailwind that like makes it easier and better to use. Like, especially if you don't like all the CSS classes, but my thought and my argument just is that there's a better way. Like, and I think CS modu CS CSS modules are it because you get editor support to go immediately to where that class is defined and you can immediately link up um, a CSS class definition with the actual element it's being applied to. But yeah. Not necessarily that a, I guess like a, a sure, like a web crawler might make sense of the content, but I think it's also for accessibility and like screen readers. Yeah. Okay. Can I get more coding garden stickers? Yeah. <laughs> Again, DM me and I'll, I'll mail them to you. Uh, SAS or creating your own CSS preprocessor with post CSS. I wouldn't create my own, but I would use uh, like post CSS uh, preset ENV. Um, and I just recently like, I think I just recently decided this. Um, this is deprecated. It's been moved here. Um, because the idea with post CSS preset ENV is it takes all of the up and coming CSS features and allows and it lets you use them today. And that's kind of why things like SAS or less or stylus were created because uh, for a better developer experience, <laughs> it, all, it all comes down to developer experience because at the end of the day, you're just generating CSS because that's what the browser understands. So um, SAS was really great when it came along because it added uh, variables, which we didn't have in CSS at the time, like this. It added nesting, which we didn't have in CSS at the time. It added like partials and imports, which we didn't have in CSS at the time. But today, um, you can do imports. You can do nest. Well, not you can't do nesting today, but it's a it's an upcoming feature of CSS. And then you can do variables in CSS today. So a lot of the things that SAS added didn't exist in CSS, but they exist today. And then, so my my reason why I would use post CSS is it lets you use the syntax of the future today. So if you're going to be using CSS, if you're going to be using variables, it makes sense to use the variables, the native variables, uh, rather than, uh, like using SAS to do it. At least that's, that's what I'm thinking about it. Um, so yeah, if I had to start a project today, I would just use post CSS. I don't think I would use SAS. Yeah, yeah. So if you look at the uh, post CSS website, uh, I think it's like still a stage zero. Um, but if you look at uh, nesting, nesting, the syntax is slightly different um, from how SAS did it because it actually requires you to use this ampersand. But um, this is a stage zero proposal in the CSS language. Um, but it will allow you to do the do the nesting here. 
So yeah, it's coming. It's coming. Um, and what's up, Traxxas? Uh, what do I use to code? I typically use uh, VS Code. You can see all of my um, my settings and, and stuff there. If you go to go to that Git repo, it talks about what I use. And Killer's saying, what I don't like about CSS modules is that it makes it easier for devs to be inconsistent. Yeah, I would agree with that because Tailwind does add, um, or it basically gives you consistent sizing across your the CSS classes that you're using. Whereas if you don't have that, um, you're not, um, you, you have to come up with like your own design system to do that. Um, someone recommended uh, this thing. I need to go with the, the packages that I've starred. What is it called? Open props. This, I think, is the solution to that. So you essentially uh, add these variables to your page, and then you use them everywhere in your code. So it's similar to how Tailwind has a predefined like radius to or like padding to or margin to. This gives you CSS variables with all of those sensible defaults. Um, so you can just import it, and now you have access to all of those variables, and you essentially have like a more consistent base design system like you would with uh, Tailwind. So I would argue that yeah, like if you're if you're going to do it yourself, use something like this because that's the, one of the benefits of Tailwind is you have like consistent sizing across like the things. So, but this is a super cool idea. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, how many minutes of silence are in a coding garden stream? Not much. I mean, every now and then I'll take a sip. Or every now and then I'll just be like thinking when I'm coding. So, um, there's probably like at most 10 minutes of silence in a <laughs> three hour stream. <laughs> yeah, I think I did. I already, I didn't archive the entropy repo, but I think, I think I'll sunset it. Like we started on it over two years ago. I think even the day that I started on it, it was not something that I had planned to do long term. And I think if we wrote a chat client today, I would want to build it on top of industry standard technologies like IRC, some kind of encryption or like, uh, uh, what's the word? Bidirectional encryption or uh, what's the word? It's encrypted on both sides. The server can't read the messages. Whatever, the end-to-end, end-to-end. I don't know why I couldn't think of that. Doing like end-to-end -end encryption in messaging. So those are all things that, like entropy was never meant to be that. Yeah, end-to-end. -end. Entropy was never meant to be that. Entropy was almost just like a how to build a full stack app that does messaging, but yeah. Uh, it's on no one has asked. Some people have, but I think they left. And honestly, like, I think because I answered so many questions today, I'm exhausted. I'm already exhausted. <laughs> like, this is probably some, some of the most questions I've ever answered in a single stream, though I haven't actually written any any code. So, yeah. Um, have I seen this TypeScript JSON validator? Any thoughts? Let's look at it really quick. What's up, Mitzik? Welcome in. No, IRC isn't the industry standard, but it is, it is a standard. Like, so, like... Like Twi Twitch uses IRC, right? That, that, that is a thing. I, I think like Jabber might be another technology that I look into. Um, there, there. All I'm saying is there are things that have been around for a long time that would make more sense to do than just like a CRUD app storing messages unencrypted in a Mongo database. That's all I'm saying. And I'd have to look into it. What's up, Data Dev? Welcome in. Um. So what do I think of this? It has 1.6 thousand stars, meaning some people use it. Um, let's look it up on NPM. Um, it has 2,000 weekly downloads. Let's look at the API. Do I agree with the, ter the API? Assert type. Assert or like is. Validate. Cool. It seems fine. Um, this would be compared to like Zod, um, which is like a, a validator. I think the one thing about TypeScript JSON um, is it probably works at runtime or like 
I guess like the type validators are, can be used. I guess technically Zod is runtime validation too. I don't know. Zod is probably the more popular one. You can see Zod has 1.2 million downloads. Um, and it works like on object schemas. It does not compare to Zod because it uses interface interfaces for, for, for validation. The thing is like Zod is kind of like the reverse because you could, you can generate the uh, interfaces from the validator. Um, whereas, I mean, I think I just need to see a better example of where you would use this. Oh, I see. You're passing in the type and then it validates it from there. I see. I see. Cause you're passing in the type. Yeah. There's a, there, there are some libraries that, um, that will do that, that are not called TypeScript JSON. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of the one that's used by, um, uh, feathers JS because the feathers V five, um, is going to be, is the next version of feathers. And then they introduce this idea of, um, schemas. And then it uses a thing called Typebox. That's why I even looked it up, because Typebox is another library for this. Mm, that's not it. JSON schema type builder and type resolution. Um, so the, the thing about Typebox is it lets you use JSON schema. I don't know if uh, the TypeScript JSON lets you use JSON schema. But that's one of the nice things here is like JSON schema is a standard that's used like not just in the JavaScript world, it's used on like other backends and stuff. So you could take the types defined there and like use them, create validators for them. Um, let's say you have the following type. Oh, oh, true Mark, it's, they're, like, they're like typo squatting if you don't install the right type box. Express it this way and then infer it back. So yeah, I think again, um, this, these two might not do what's happening here where you just pass it an interface and it uh, generates the validator for it. So yeah, it seems cool. I've, I think if you're working in a code base that already has a bunch of interfaces defined and you, you don't want to go back through and like recreate them using like Zod or Typebox or any of the others, it makes sense. I think it makes sense. How many more questions do I have to ask until I get the avatar thing correct? <laughs> wait, wait, are you are you asking for help? I don't know, I don't know what you're asking. Um, have I been streaming outside? Yeah, yeah. Um, you can see the, the all of the the streams I've done um, over here on this link, um, and then I might end stream soon, eat some lunch, and then go for a walk and live stream that. So uh, definitely go follow my. Um, my personal channel, um, because this is where I will do the IRL stream. So I'll be, I'll be live a little bit later today, uh, walking around. I think, I think I'm just going to go walk at a park, but it'll be fun to see. It's like a two mile trail around a park. Um, yeah, yeah. It worked on the, oh, you mean like deleting the question or whatever else worked? Um, yeah, and so welcome in, Sonny. We talked about this earlier, but Vutify 3 is officially out. You still have to go to next.vutifyjs.com, but version 3 is officially supported. So like, if, and you still have to do, you have to install uh, Vutify at next or like use their CLI tool, but it's, it's not alpha. It is, it is officially released. Um, I think for now they're keeping it here because so many people were still on version two. Uh, so, but do know that it's official. It works for view three. So yeah. Can I shout out my live channel? This one? There should be a, there should be a shout out thing happening right now. Is that what you mean, uh, David? I also have the uh, another channel <laughs> called Probably Happening, and this is where I make music. Though we haven't streamed in like over a week, we probably won't stream again until next week. So yeah. 
Uh, suggested data, uh, data, data structures and algorithms course. Um, I don't have any good suggestions. I do know that the Primogen worked on a data structures and algorithms course with TypeScript, I think. So you can check that out. And I do believe it's free. It's free over on um, front end masters. Yeah. All right, we're going to answer this question, and then I got to go. So this comes from this is theory, who says, what's the best practice folder structure for an Express API? More specifically, if a route has a bunch of complex logic, do I break all of that logic into some other file or folder? Yeah, and then that link right there will take you to the Primogen's course. Um, so let's talk about this. Uh, you can see an example of, of a more recent, like it's a simple app that I built, but it was it's a part of this TypeScript series that I was working on. Um, and you can see where I put the stuff. So if you specifically look at this Express API, got all your configs here, then you have a source folder. Um, you have the top level app, and uh, which can be tested, and then the index, which loads the app and actually starts the, the app up. I got all of my interfaces stored in here, though sometimes I'll actually store the interfaces next to the the where they're most typically used. These are for like interfaces used all over the code. And then uh, in this case, which is like, this is purely a JSON API, I have an API folder and that will contain all of my routers. Um, and so if you look at my to-dos folder, this is all of the to-dos routes and everything associated with it. So I have a, a file for my models and my interfaces a file for my handlers and some people might call this controllers i'm just calling it handlers and then a file that defines all of the routes and then a file for the tests um but you could you could actually break this down even further um and add like a what's called like a data access layer because if you look at my handlers file this is actually mixing database access with uh uh uh, response code and so things that are like express specific like res and next so uh, a lot of people would argue that this is not good because I basically have intermingled my data access and my um, my request handling so what you might do is a further abstraction where like anywhere that I'm talking to a database I extract that out into a DAL or a data access layer and then I would have a another file where all of the, the queries or data access are defined as functions. And then inside of the handlers, I call those functions. Um, so yeah. Yeah, and see you later, BTRSL. I, I didn't get to answer your bigger question, but but thank you for hanging out. So uh, this is one way I like to do it. Like, especially as your app grows, it makes sense to break it down like this. Um, and then like the other reason why you would extract the the data access from here is that if you ever need to change your database, instead of having to go through everywhere there's a data query, if you extract it into more generalized functions, now that's the only place you need to update if you change your database or change your database driver. Uh, so that's that's another thing as well. Uh, the other thing is, I don't demonstrate it in this app, but this model file right now just has a single interface called to-do. So a to-do is an object that can have a content property and a done property. Uh, the other aspect of bigger apps is you have interfaces that define all of the different ways that, that you deal with this data. So uh, for one, if somebody is creating a to-do, a to -do, like making a post request, it only includes two properties, content and done, right? It, it doesn't exist yet, so it doesn't include an ID property. And also it doesn't make sense for the client to send the created at and updated at fields. So the th this is essentially a uh, an interface that describes the data that the API will be receiving. Yeah, and so Oscar is getting is is giving demonstra uh, examples of how you would do this like with a user object. So, th and th these are known as DTOs or data transfer objects. So like, this is a to do uh, in transit. So a to do being created. A to do that has already been created is a to do with ID. So this is this expands on that interface and adds an ID property. But the only ever time you'll deal with that interface is if you're receiving it in a response. Similar ID with uh, a similar idea with the user object. So, when someone when a user is being created, it probably needs like an email and a password and a username, something like that. But when you're listing users, you don't want to include that password property. So you would have another interface uh, that describes the user response data transfer object. So that's that's another thing for 
uh, how you would structure this app. And typically, all of those interfaces might define in this file, or you might have a separate folder called DTO or data transfer objects where you put all of the separate interfaces inside of as well. Um, so yeah, if a route has a bunch of comp complex logic, do you break it out? I think you break it out. Um, first of all, if it's like data access specific, yeah, break it out into a specific data access file. Um, and um, uh, if you're if you're doing things that are like used in multiple places, then I I think it makes sense to break down into more separate functions, but. Again, it's like a case by case basis. Yeah. And if you're using Next or Net, actually, yeah, if you're using Nest, um, it probably has a lot of these opinions. You, you can you can actually learn a lot from how Nest.js is doing it. Because um, I do believe Nest was definitely inspired by some of the more enterprisey type of things. Um, so, honestly, if you look at how they structure things, you could either use Nest.js yourself, or you could take some of their ideas and structure your own Express app uh, in that way. So yeah, cool. That's all I got. Thank you for the question. This is theory. Um, data access object versus a service. I don't know the difference between the two. I think it's I consider it the same thing. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, and here's the link to uh, this Express API, if you want to look at that too. Uh, They're kind of the same thing because, like, the service is an abstraction. It's an abstraction layer to interacting with the data. So, I, to me, they're one and the same. You probably, if you know more about this, or if these names mean something different in whatever programming language or framework you're in, you could probably talk about the differences. But to me, they seem kind of the same. Um, and I guess I would I would be comparing a data access layer with a service. The data access object is you would use within a service. How many more questions do I have to ask until I get the avatar thing right? <laughs> That's I, I get it now. You're working on the code. That's why you're asking the questions so that you can test your code out. Yeah. I guess that's kind of true, huh, Mark? I've talked about this before. I've talked about how <laughs> in my old age as a, as a programmer that's been around for a long time, I am leaning more towards opinionated things because it forces developers to be consistent. Whereas React and Next does not force developers to be consistent. So you end up with a big old mess. And it, it depends, right? If you're a good developer and you're, you have good code hygiene and good, good, good habits, you can still write a decent app with Next and React. But it's also just as easy to write uh, a bad app. <laughs> with it. So that's all I'm saying. Is the IRL stream a dog stream? Uh, I don't think it will be, no. I mean, maybe, though, because he does need a walk. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> uh, Vue or React, which is more beginner-friendly? I argue that Vue is more beginner-friendly because if, like, if you define beginner, you probably already know HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and Vue is closer to, the, to that. React introduces a lot of new concepts. Like JSX is new. You have to learn a lot about the syntax, where do the curly braces go, all of that stuff. Whereas Vue, for the most part, uses HTML with a little bit of handlebars, but it's it's not as complex to learn. So that's that's my argument for, for, for beginners. I actually am not cl uh, collecting the latest sets, uh, but I did just open up the, um, uh, the Charizard Ultra Premium Collection, and that was really cool. Um, it's baffling to me that the promo cards in that box are like almost worth as much as the box itself. Um, and I just ordered, because they're so easy to get, I just ordered another one and I might open it on stream. I haven't opened Pokemon cards on stream in a while, but I will say that my Pokemon collecting has died down a bit. I'm not trying to collect all of them. I'm really just collecting the cool cards instead of trying to collect everything. And, and cool by my own terms, cards that I like, sets that I like. What's the best way to learn React? Uh, I don't have a good answer for you, but probably the 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 beta React docs. Um, they're they're revamping all of the docs, and that's probably a good place to start. Cool. Um, I don't have a good answer for you on this Namaste Geek, but but I did. I think I talked about it in my last uh, Q and A stream because I added it as a video on YouTube. I don't know if you've seen it or not, but it's this, what programming language should I learn first? Um, if you 
just scroll to the description. I have timestamps. So I do have a timestamp for uh, do you want to make games? And I talk about what are the things for making games. Um, you technically can build games with web, te web technologies. Um, but I would argue, like, if you want to make a game that can go into, like, the Xbox Indie Store or, like, in the Steam Store, um, you probably don't want to use web development for that. But if you just want to host a game on a website that people can go to, you could use web dev for that. But I'd say check out my video for a more in-depth answer. Have I seen this? All right, this is the last thing I'm going to click. Component party. Wait, is this just examples of Svelte and React? Yeah. Yeah, no worries, Namaste Geek. Hope, hopefully it has some good info. What am I looking at, Oscar? <laughs> oh, you can compare them. Yeah, this is kind of insane. I should have built this. Like I've been I've been doing this for years. <laughs> like if you if you if you look at my my YouTube channel and search for like coding garden uh front end showdown or showdown or showcase. Um, yeah, four years ago, I built the same app with vanilla, React, Angular, and Vue 6. And then I did another one in 2020, um, which is a bit more relevant. Yeah, 2020. And then that one was a seven hour stream because I talk a lot. But this is this is this is kind of amazing, Oscar. Thanks for sharing it because it's basically like, how do you do the same thing across all of these all of these frameworks? So you can compare them, and like on the surface, Svelte looks the most approachable, like hands down, hands down. Svelte is the most approachable. <laughs> Excuse me. Solid looks the most like React, and um, is probably more approachable for. I don't know. I mean, that still looks like, I mean, this isn't a good showcase of signals because like it looks like React, but this is, this is better and easier to learn than React because there's not all the, these aren't um, like hooks. They don't have like the same rules of hooks. Computed state. Uh, no, I would argue that th they didn't do it. They, they should use memo here. Um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to make a quick pull request. So now this, this, I mean, you think about this as like a, a potentially complex operation, and this won't be recalculated unless the count variable uh, changes. The other way, it's going to recalculate on every render. So that's why you would want to do this instead. Um, update React computed to use use memo instead of inline. You probably wouldn't memoize the simple calculation, but all of, the, all of their calculations are simple. So um, I would argue that you want to show that use memo exists. Um, I don't know. I'm just gonna, somebody might have made this pro this proposition at one point. Um, I'm gonna create the pull request. Um, this simple example likely wouldn't require uh, use use memo in the real world, but this is the closest to computed state like the other examples. This simple example wouldn't require the use of. <laughs> but it, this is the closest to like the other examples. OK, there we go. Pull request. Honestly, I, 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 did, I did a bad thing. I should have seen if anybody has done this before. No, they haven't. And then also, if we look at the history of that file, are we in the real world? I don't know. But if we go, if we go, blame this file, we can see if um, 
somebody has already made that suggestion before. Let's look at it on the main branch. And then um, remove use memo for, yeah, see, somebody did it three months ago. Um, it's not idiomatic to use memo for, for <sighs> but see, that's the thing. There are so many React developers that don't even know that use memo exists. Like, like if you're using Vue.js, like from the get go, you learn about computed properties and then you're instantly just writing more performant code because you know that computed is a thing that you can use. Whereas in React, I would argue like there have been people, there are people that have been using React for one or two years that don't even know that use memo exists. Um, so I don't know. I don't know. I made a PR. That's that's fine. I, I people it's probably gonna get closed and they're like, ah, but I don't know. I don't know. All right, I'm gonna go now. Thank you everybody for hanging out. Uh, this is super fun. Um, I think JMO did ask a question. Um, let me try to answer it before I go. And refactorer, 31 months. That's a long time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and and I would argue that obviously for simple calculations it's more expensive, but. Do they have a more complex computed property example on component party? Because if they don't, then are they are they using um, I don't even know the, how what the website is component party dev yeah. Um, because if they don't then how are people going to know that use memo is, is even exists? Yeah, Rask has never used use memo. <laughs> What's the difference between, yeah, so a use memo, uh, if you want to write it yourself, is the combination of a use state and a use effect because you could have a use effect that updates a state variable when certain things change. Same, th that use memo is the same thing with less steps. Yeah, I, I'm not even going to worry about it. I, they're probably going to close the PR anyways. Okay. Um, why does a new array created as props get all the array props changed when you change one of them? Yeah, in a way, it's a shorthand. Um, I did a stream a while back where I talked about use memo, and I kind of showed we used use memo, and then I just showed how to write it with a use effect in a use state. Um, Yeah, it's somewhere in there. Oh, this one has timestamps. I, I love it when I add timestamps to a, to a big long stream because you can go to uh, 3219 and find the um, the use memo example. Yeah, thank you, thank you for hanging out, Namaste Geek. All right, let's see if I can answer this really quick. Okay, what's the issue? Okay, so you yeah, you bound the V model. V model at that index number property. Ah, because you're, so yeah, this, this is the answer. So uh, this is the same object for every single one. So because this is the same object, no matter where I type, these are all referencing the same object. Um, you would need to create a, a new object for the fill. In this case, map runs a new function that returns a new object. So each one has their own object. So they don't modify, they don't change each other. But if you want these to behave the same way, you would basically like take this and define it outside here, like um, shared, like this. So if I put the shared one above and then return that same shared one in this example, um, now, now this this modifies all of them. Uh, if you want to fix it, you can do the, do like an inline iffy that creates a new, or actually just create a create a function that. Um, um, well, no, that's not going to work because fill only takes a single value. Yeah, you can't do it with fill because 
Um, yeah, if you want them to be unique, you have to use map because fill accepts an individual value and it's just going to repeat that value in the array and they all share the same reference. So yeah, you, you want to, you want to do the map version. Um, and then, yeah, so let me show an example with from that'll be a little bit easier. So if you do, um, array dot from, if you want it to be length four, so you can do this and then this accepts essentially like a map function. Um, so you can just pass it in um, like this. And I guess you don't want the shared one. You want like this. Um, so there's got to be a better way to, <laughs> to show this. Um, yeah. So uh, basically what this does is this creates an array and and does a map all in one go so this i mean you have tiny arrays you probably don't have to worry about performance but this this is more performant than the map because uh you spread the array which is one iteration and then the map is another iteration this will call this function as it creates the array so so fill is sharing the object and putting it in all the slots Whereas map invokes the function for every slot, which means it gets a new copy of that object for every slot. Yeah, that's the main difference. But now these are these are different, so they're not they're not shared. Hopefully, hopefully that helps. And here I'll uh, yeah, let me copy this. I'll share share it. It's funny how that's the only code we wrote today. <laughs> uh, again, uh, go check out my. Um, my personal channel, I'll be I'll be doing an IRL stream on there uh, in a few hours. I'm just gonna be walking around a park. Um, so if you wanna see that, definitely go follow over there. Uh, also, I have a, a mailing list. Um, I guess that's true, Hunt Drills. Like uh, sometimes you just gotta talk to answer people's questions. <laughs> but if you wanna get notified when I go live, uh, join the mailing list. And, um. I guess that's it. Also, check out my YouTube. I have a schedule, uh, and I'll be live again here on Friday. So if you look, if you check out the schedule, you can see when I go live as well. All right, let's go on a raid. And and thank you for hanging out or being here, Andreas. Appreciate you. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, and uh, if you want to support me, <laughs> sign up for privacy. Um, okay, what am I doing? Yeah, let's go on a raid. So here are our raid message. GG, Alkas. Uh, thank you for, for hanging out. I just called you Alkas with an S. Has anybody ever done that? <laughs> How you doing, Alkas? Um, if you're a sub, you could use that raid message. If you're not a sub, you could use that raid message. Never. Well, I'm going to call you Alkas now. Alsi? Alsi, how you doing? <laughs> uh, let's go on a raid. Um... And like I said, follow the W3CJ channel if you want to see my IRL streams. I don't know where we're going to raid, but wherever we raid, show them lots of love. Drop a follow if you like what they're doing, all that good stuff. Um, and wherever you are in the world, have a wonderful morning, afternoon, evening, or night. And until next time, here's this. Mm -hmm.